The California Board of Occupational Therapy, it's 1211. I do thank you for your patience. We know we're a little bit late. It was one of those scenarios where we got in line at Starbucks and we were committed because we were four people away when it was our deadline. So with that being said, I do want to draw your attention to our agenda item. And please note that we are going to take agenda item 9. We're going to take items out of order and take 9 first before we uh, come back to the regular agenda. So with that, item agenda number 9 is presentation by Heidi Lenzer, PhD, Chief Office of Professional Examination Services, Department of Consumer Affairs, on completing a practice analysis and occupational analysis and the estimated schedules and costs. And with that, others, do you have anything to add or should we just have our speaker go? We also want to welcome all the students that have joined us from San Jose State University. Um, it's very pleasing to have you here join the board. So with that, I have you. Good afternoon. I'm Heidi Linser. I am the Chief of the Office of Professional <laughs> Examination Services, part of um, the Department of Consumer Affairs. And I'm going to give you a pretty short presentation, so hopefully you're awake now you got your coffee. We were awake all along, <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way. Hey, right in front of the camera. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Well, the other. <laughs> the, the other one, I think. Whoever, do you prefer both lights that you find like this? Yeah, this is okay. Thank you, thank you, John. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the help with the technology. Um, overview, is this good? I'm good, okay. thank you, thank you. Overview of the presentation. Um, first is going to be an introduction to the Office of Professional Examination Services, um, legal mandates and professional standards, what is an occupational analysis, uh, why review national examinations, what is a linkage study, and scheduling costs. I know you talked a little bit about this at your last board meeting, and I'm really um, pleased that you allowed me to come and um, give a presentation from OPA. So OPS mission is to protect the interests of consumers by supporting the Department of Consumer Affairs and its regulatory entities in their commitment to establish and maintain licensure examination programs that are fair, valid, and legally defensible. And that's quite a mouthful. But what we do is we work with the boards and bureaus and other regulatory entities within DCA to work to assist them with their licensure examinations. And we're basically a professional consulting division as part of DCA. So what services do we provide? We perform all aspects of licensure validation process, including occupational analysis. That's also called practice analysis, as you were um, talking to your national association. It's often called practice analysis or job analysis. Uh, we do examination development for boards that have California-based examinations or supplemental examinations in addition to their national examinations. We do test scoring and statistical item analysis when we work with um, those boards and do exam development. And we do national examination review. So for boards that do have national examinations, such as yours, we do a review or an audit of those national examinations. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we also oversee DCA's master contract for computer-based test administration. So any board or bureau that um, wants uh, to have their exams administered, we manage a service contract for that. And we also report to the legislature the mandates of business and professions code section 139, which I'm going to talk more about. So OPS clients, we have uh, all of these boards, bureaus, committees are some of our, are all of our clients. We have uh, that we work with 23 regulatory agencies. We developed 43 examinations, and most uh, recently uh, doing projects such as the one we are proposing to do for you. We worked um, most recently with speech language pathology to do an occupational analysis and a review of their national exam. We worked with, um, we're doing an occupational analysis right now for audiologists, and we're going to review the audiologist national exam. And we just uh, finished occupational analysis with chiropractors, and we're going to do an audit of their national exam. So how does OPS ensure the validity of licensure examinations? We provide services and recommendations based on legal mandates and professional standards. 
is to ensure that the examinations used by DCA are valid and fair for California candidates. So as I said, if there's a state-based exam, we're a lot of times directly involved with developing and maintaining that examination. If there's a national examination, we still work with boards to conduct occupational analyses every five to seven years and to review their national exams. We are unique in that we maintain an independent and objective perspective in the development evaluation of licensure examinations. Because we're a state agency, we don't have a financial interest in any of these um, the examinations that we, we oversee or that we audit. Um, we are funded through intra-agency agreements with um, DCA clients. So legal mandates regarding licensure examinations. There's government code that says that the uh, licensing examinations must be job related. Business and Professions Code 139 mandates that occupational analyses and validation studies are fundamental components of licensure examinations. Requirements for licensure programs, they must meet professional standards, and I'm going to go into those. They must be evaluated regularly every five to seven years, and they must be reported annually to the legislature of when they were last um, evaluated. So professional standards for licensing examinations. There are technical and professional standards. These are national standards that all um, professional testing entities are um, supposed to be following. Um, there's the standards for educational and psychological testing, principles for validation and use of personnel selection procedures, and uniform guidelines on employee selection procedures. And the purpose of these standards and guidelines is to make sure that licensing examinations measure what licensees actually do in the field. It's to make sure they're valid, to make sure they're job related. So it's to make sure that arbitrary information isn't tested on a licensure examination. And we go through a whole process of validating that the information on a licensure examination is required, it's critical for practice, it's critical to maintain public protection, and it's also at entry level. And you heard a, little, a lot about that from your national um, association, and they follow the same standards as well. So what is an occupational analysis or practice analysis? It's a study of a profession. It defines the task that new licensees must be able to perform at the time of licensure and identifies the underlying knowledge required to perform those tasks. So what is the purpose of it? It provides um, we consider that there's many reasons to do an occupational analysis. Provides a current description of practice that's used to develop an examination outline as for your national exam. They did a practice analysis and then they use that to develop the examination outline for the examination. But it also can be used for other things like to assist stakeholders with decisions regarding practice issues. And I heard you talking about some of those issues. It can be very helpful to understand the depth, breadth, and current trends of a profession and to look at overlap between different professions. I know that most of the healing arts, there's some overlap among, there's, I know for you, there's probably you know, physical therapy and speech language and there might be others. So it's a, nice, it's a good thing to have, to have that current description of practice and to be able to compare to your other um, overlapping professions and see um, where they agree, where they have similarities, and where they have differences. And also, as you guys were talking about your CE, your professional development units, it can be used for that. We, um, a lot of boards are looking at their, re-looking at their professional development um, our units and what they should accept and not accept. And the occupational analysis can be used because it's a very detailed description of the practice and can be used to say, does this, uh, this uh, program that we're looking at for CE, this course, does it fit within the, the scope of practice? And the occupational analysis would be helpful for that because it's very detailed task and knowledge and you could link your CE coursework to that if you needed to. So the occupational analysis process, um, it's a lengthy process. Um, it takes about nine months to conduct, to do this study. Here. No, whenever you just a little step. I'm sorry about that. You okay. were blocking the camera. I'm blocking the camera. Okay. Uh, you, okay. I'm I'm sorry. You can. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Which you can you still face in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, 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 no. Sorry about that. It would just a little space this way. You can stay the same way. I'm sorry okay. about that. Here, just fit. That way you can face them. Okay. Yeah. Sorry okay. about that. Okay. So the steps of the occupational analysis. 
first step, we perform background research. So we would read about the profession. We would look at the national uh, practice analysis. We conduct interviews with um, subject matter experts. So we work with the board. The board would select subject matter experts who are willing to participate in the process. We conduct telephone interviews to ask uh, licensees what they do in the course of their work. And we have focus groups to review that information that we collect. The information is we collect is in the form of the tasks that you perform in your work and the knowledge needed to perform those tasks. And so we have uh, two focus groups to review and finalize the task and knowledge statements. From that, we develop an occupational analysis survey. That survey goes out to all, all licensees, or if they have a large uh, profession, then a sample of licensees. And licensees are asked to review those tasks and knowledges. They're asked, how often do you perform these tasks? How important are they to practice? And how important is the knowledge? And that information is used to uh, determine the weights of things on the examination. So for example, things that are done more frequently, frequently or things that are rated more important get more weight on an examination, and things that are done, maybe not done so frequently, but are very important, still get weight. When we analyze the data, we multiply the frequency ratings times the importance ratings, so both frequency and importance get weighted in that process. We re review the survey results with SMEs. We review um, the dem we collect demographic data, and then we determine, based on the SME input, um, a final examination outline. There may be things that we put on the survey that are no longer being performed. They may be outdated. So when the ratings that we get can determine, well, this isn't being done anymore, so it might drop off the examination outline. So we would work with the subject matter experts to determine if things should be dropped off and determine the weights of which parts of content areas of the profession are more important relatively. Of course, everything that comes out of the examination outline, everything is, is important. And then we write a validation report, and that is provided to the board. We also can come and give a presentation at your board meeting of the results. So I kept talking about examination outline. The examination outline is based on the description of practice developed in the occupational analysis. It specifies the critical tasks and knowledge to be tested. It identifies the relative weight or percentage of each major subject area to be assessed. And it provides a direct link between job content and examination content. So why are occupational analyses critical in exam development? Um, both legislation and professional testing standards require that examinations are job related. And this is the process to defend that it is job related by going through the occupational analysis process. It's your validity of your exam. The content domain should be clearly defined and justified in terms of the importance of, con of the content for credential worthy performance. And as I said, forms the basis for legal defensibility of an examination. So you might say, well, our national <coughs> exam data practice analysis, why do we have to do one? And why do national examinations need to be reviewed? So I will, you'll understand that a little bit better. Um, required by Business and Professions Code, all national exams need to be reviewed when they're used for California licensure. And we need to verify that professional testing standards are met. As I said, they're standards that um, most test providers follow. However, they, there's a degree of which they can follow them and, and we want to make sure that they're following them as best as they can. There's a lot of gray areas. Uh, requires a current California occupational analysis. We compare the California specific occupational analysis to the national practice analysis and make sure that California content is covered on your national examination. And we determine if California specific content is covered. So to review the national examinations, we evaluate the occupational analysis. We review the examination development process that the national vendor uses. We review the procedures for establishing the passing score. There are many different methods to develop the passing score. We want to make sure it's an appropriate method for that type of test in that population. We review the examination scoring and passing rates. We review test administration and security procedures. Most national exams are um, administered at outside vendors, Prometric, Pearson. Um, so 
we want to make sure that those procedures, um, security procedures are followed. We review candidate information, make sure candidates are getting the information they need before they take the test. We also conduct a linkage study, which I'm going to talk about, and write a report. The linkage study. That identifies areas of California practice that are evaluated and not evaluated by the national exam. So it's based on the California occupational analysis results. We have subject matters, matter experts come in, review the examination outline from California, and compare it to the national. And it's used to identify if California-specific information is needed. So, information or examination? California specific information needs to be covered on a California based examination. Okay. So, here's a little diagram that explains it. So, your national practice analysis, your national practice examination should be covering the majority of California practice. So, you can see that overlap there. But there may be some California specific practice areas such as laws and regs. We know California-specific laws and regs are not covered on a national exam. And there may be other practice-related things that I understand you may have in your profession, such as hand therapy and swallowing assessment. Mm -hmm. So those things, when we do the um, linkage study, we will identify what is covered and what isn't covered to give the board the information to decide if there is enough information that they would like to have a California specific examination to cover the excess. And boards, some boards have a California specific exam, some boards say it's all covered by the national and there's only some basic California laws and regs and we're not, we don't think that's enough to make an examination. So we would assist the board with that process. So schedule and costs. I uh, you had been given some costs um, at your last board meeting. The occupational analysis takes about nine months, depending, depending on variables such as subject matter expert availability. All, the entire process involves subject matter experts. About 40 to 50 people would be involved in that process, plus the survey goes out to the entire um, profession. And it costs um, about $50,000 for the occupational analysis and that's to reimburse OPES for their staff time. We do not um, make profit. We're, we're obviously part of DCA. That um, would be less cost than going outside to a vendor to do it. Um, the National Examination Review costs about uh, $21,000, takes about six months, and depending on how easy it is for us to get information from the National Examination, it could take a little less time. And, um, so, thank you. That's what I have to tell you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. As soon as the lights go on, I'll open it up for questions. Um, just thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, just to further provide some background to the rest of the board, um, it is accurate. This was an agenda item that did come before us. We did vote on it, and we had a very robust discussion about costs and such. Since that time, um, your office has come to Heather and provided Heather with further clarification. I think, Heather, what would be helpful to generate discussion around this is if you, could you go back to your last slide, the one on cost time frames, because that's really where we're at, yeah. Um, keeping in mind, if, if you could explain time frames, if this board makes a decision today to revisit this, if the board makes a decision, or it would be to put on a future <coughs> or to make a decision. What's the what's the protocol? What, what's the protocol for us on what we'd be able to do here? Today? Mm -hmm. Well, it's just a presentation. It's okay. okay. It's so it would have to go in a future. Okay, but if you could identify for this board what those that nine months starting when? Because we might not even be on this. Well, yeah. Wouldn't we have to go to the? Yes, she's going to explain that. So if you could walk them through that. Um. So the sample um, schedule that I was given um, actually crosses a little bit over two fiscal years, and that was starting, for example, in March of this year, and then uh, wrapping up in August, October of next year, basically. Um, one of 
the concerns are obviously is the, the cost involved because we do not have a specific line item for this. And what that means is that if the board did decide they wanted to do that, then we are um, bound by a uh, budget change proposal deadlines. So for example, in um, March, April, we could ask for the money and if it was approved um, by the Department of Consumer Affairs and Agency and the Department of Finance and the legislature, then we get the money in July of 2018. That means they would take it out of the fund and actually add it to the budget so that we could afford to do these things, which is reimburse OPES, pay for the travel and the per diem for the SMEs because they're kind of the time is worth something and that's usually what courts do to get the kitchen state. Um, and then how, just from our, I know you put this every day, so if that's what we have to do from a budget analysis perspective, then if you could tie back to your statement, how would we actually be starting in March? So that was this, the, it was a sample schedule given um, in December. Um, when this fiscal year funding is not the issue, there's the lack of funding for this in the next fiscal year. So if the budget <coughs> is augmented by the amount necessary to do this as of July of 2018, then we would try to get on OPS's calendar to start July, August-ish of 2018, which would wrap up in March of 19, all within the same fiscal year. So, what that means to us, although um, although we have, um, although I'm going to start, although we're not a fan as a board of revisiting something we've already voted on, we now have more information. And when you look at that timeline and you look at what's really before this board, what's really before this board today and, and we, is to decide if we want to look at budget revisions, if we think that this is a good idea, if we want to look at budget revisions that would put it into a different fiscal year, and why I say that statement is it takes us that farther out. Our big concern was the cost we just put forth with Breeze, the increase in our fees, all the things, all those reasons. Is it a fair statement to say they exist differently? Is that a fair statement? Is that yeah. They're not as, it's not as, um, budget was a driver for us in our decision. So with that, I would open it up to further comments and questions from, is that enough framing for everybody around it? Okay, so, comment? Um, also, also, I did want to refer to the board to the materials. One was the occupational analysis overview, a little more detail of what's covered in the national exam. <coughs> The specific BNP code that the following um, the policy follows it, and it's that policy is based on that business and professions code. So, mm -hmm. for example, where it says the department needs to report to the legislature every year, the um, office asks us for information. We reach out to NBCOT to ask for the um, date of the most recent occupational analysis for the national exam, we report that to OPES and that information goes into one uh, collective report that they submit on behalf of the legislature. If, if the board did want to do this and it wrapped up in uh, March of 19, then the board obviously would um, get um, a report on that and then based on what that report says, for example, the majority of the items in California are covered by the national exam. Um, I think, it, would it include a recommendation, yes or no, on the state exam? Yes. Okay, so it would include the recommendation. The board could then um, discuss that in uh, a meeting, decide um, what they wanted to do, because if, and I, I say if, if as a result of this, the board identified something that was either perhaps overregulated or that was missing, if you wanted to do any regs, I mean, you're looking at late 2020. I mean, so I, I mean, it sounds, I'll, I mean, there's a certain steps that have to happen, but you can see with licensure in 2003 and not getting an occupational analysis until 2019, I think that's something support should. And I will also keeping also keeping in mind that the decisions that were before us now are really we, we're being tasked with visioning where the consumers going, where the professions going, which I think we want to put that kind of hat on as we think through this. 
and that's something during the process we can um, any issues that are coming to the board, practice related issues, that's something we can look at as part of the occupational analysis. And I do want to um, let you know that during sunset, a lot of boards are asked why, you know, when was your last California occupational analysis? And um, the legislature is familiar with the requirements and also the, they are, we don't see any problem with getting funding from BCPs to do this. Once you get this funding, the first time is difficult. After that, it can get added to your budget so that it gets, um, that you do it every five to seven years, which is what's required. It's just the first hurdle is getting the understanding of that we have to do this and getting it into your budget. And after that, you'll be on a regular um, schedule. So, so this board has not done them before? No. Just use that. Yes. So we're out of compliance with the, with the code. And actually, I'd like to kind of point out a couple of things. Um, I know that the board did discuss this at the last meeting, um, and that was more in relation to um, whether to add the attestation of, hey, I swear that I've read the laws and ethics. There was a little bit of an overlap and maybe a little miscommunication in that between all parties, I suppose. Um, so I want you guys to realize that this is not a part of the adding of checkbox for the attestation that you've read the ethics and laws relating to OT for you know, for when you submit your application. I just want to make sure that that's clear. Um, no, that is not an outcome, but what my understanding is, if I may just yes. ask for your clarification, yes. it is a prelude for us being able to do that. No. Okay, that's different but, information. But if, if we but it could be underlying data. Exactly, yes. It is not, yes, and I actually I spoke with um, Tracy. Yeah. Tracy. 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 <laughs> I'm like, oh, I just saw her the other day. I spoke with Tracy Montez the other day, and um, and actually I spoke with her after the board's last meeting to get clarification on where where we were having the disconnect because I thought that we might be. Um, so basically, um, if you wanted to add the checkbox to say that yes, I swear if I read all of these things, the attestation checkbox, um, you certainly can do that. It's not required to do an occupational analysis in order to do that, but the occupational analysis will support the addition of that. So I don't want um, there to be any confusion as to one is required before you can do the other, and that's not the case. At least that was based on my conversation with Tracy, and that's your understanding? Correct. Too? It's okay. a separate issue of the right. mandate for you to so, do an occupational analysis. So the board's vote, I think, was based in part on do we want to spend $50,000 on adding a checkbox? So I want to kind of clarify the facts. It was very much. Yeah, yeah that, that this has been, that we've clarified this with OPEDS. And um, we've got clarification on that from them. And now we're identifying other reasons to have the And now analysis. we're going into where I think the disconnect was, which is the Business and Professions Code, Section 139, I think it's B, you said, um, actually does require that every single board validate its examination that it uses to issue licenses in the state. Well, even if you use a national examination, <coughs> That, act, that examination still needs to be validated, even though the board is not the one who creates it, which so, is part of what our presentation was about. So, so we've been in business since 2000, and we haven't had an occupational analysis, and, and our reports to the legislature have been satisfactory because we use the ABCFC's practice analysis. Is that the story? I imagine that it has been, but I would ask another. Yes. Well, I also noticed in their list of customers, it, the medical board's not up there, nor is the physical therapy board. Could you say more about that? We have reached. We are reaching out to um, all boards. We just we did have a meeting with physical therapy and um, medical board. Uh, haven't reached out lately. Uh, we periodically talk to all boards who are not in compliance and tell them that they need to be in compliance but ultimately the board has to move forward with the process. In the past, this is why BMP 139 was um, developed, because boards were not doing this. And so when it first um, was written and passed, we there was a big outreach to boards to tell them this is what you need to do, and it somewhat dropped off because a lot of boards are in compliance. And But it is part of onboarding of new executive officers and board members to tell them this. But um, there's still issues of funding and getting board's cooperation to do it. Please. So um, what your department does is look at what we currently have. Who would be, if we find that there are um, shortcomings in the existing exam that we are currently allowing to take place, 
one, um, I guess we would have to get either them to mend or we would have to write our own. And who would be responsible? What cost would that be? Do we know? Would it be your department that would write the exam for a state exam? It's possible. That, that doesn't happen very often. Typically when we work with the national exam and point out any things that can be improved, they're usually very cooperative to improve those things. If, that, if you're not having issues with your national exam, then that's most likely the course of action, that there's some things that we say, you know, you could do a better job at this, and they're usually very cooperative. Other things, if there are, there are a lot of problems, which you probably would know about because your, your um, industry would be telling you these things, as happens with other boards. People come to board <coughs> meetings very, very upset about the national exam. Um, when those things happen, then it's a, we give the board options of what they can do. And we certainly can develop a an exam. Then your board would would develop an interagency agreement with us, and we could develop a, a California-based exam. We only develop California-based exams. We do not do national exams. So that exam would not be portable to other people taking it in California. Wouldn't be able to go to other states unless those states recognized our exam. Okay. And then the other part to that is, um, it obviously has to be done every five to six, seven years, Yes. Um, because we would have, since this is the initial review, I would imagine you have to look at everything. On a follow-up review, would it be the same cost, would it be the same time, or would you only be looking at modifications either to the tests that have occurred since the last one, or uh, rules that we have passed since then, and see, or would it be just the same? It's pretty much the same process, because your national is going to be updating their practice analysis, and so we would still need to do the same comparison between California and the national to see if their new, you know, more revised practice analysis match our revised practice analysis. We still go through all the security issues because things change. Vendors, you know, they change vendors, they change psychometricians who are involved, so we would do the same process. I am, I'm wondering, um, and perhaps I'll start first with you, then I'll ask um, our Sean Conway here from our national certification. Um, could you talk about the interaction you would have with the National Board of Occupational Therapy, specifically? Um, to do the, the review? First initially and then ongoing. We, we don't typically have an ongoing relationship um, unless they ask for we unless they ask for our assistance, but typically we get a contact, we work with the board to um, identify a contact person at the national, and then um, we give them a list of information that we need, and I think that's in your packet, all the, inform uh, the information that we need to look at. We uh, sign security agreements that both um, are their legal and our legal are comfortable with, and then we work with whatever staff they identify. They provide us a lot of documents. We review the documents. We ask questions. Sometimes we have conference calls to get clarification. So that's how the process works. And then once we have all the information, the data, and then we do the linkage study, which is uses subject matter experts and is done um, in our office. So it's. Of the 50,000, it's 21,000 to review their exam? No, that's an additional 21,000. Mm -hmm. So we're actually looking at 75,000? 71. 71, yeah. It's two separate then, studies. Know, the the um, occupational analysis has to come first so that we have the description of practice and then to use to compare to the national. And then the national review is a separate study. So from a regular, I, I might be mixing my words, if, stop me if I'm drawing the wrong conclusion, Heather. From a regulatory standpoint, um, you know, if an occupational analysis, that, that wording, is there any outcome of this occupational analysis that will help us with workforce demand or that will get us listed in that book? about occupant, you know where I'm going with this? You know how OT is not listed as one of the... Dictionary of Occupational... For, for Dictionary, Dictionary of yeah. Occupational Type? I don't Did I just cross... I don't know the answer to that. Because the reality is I would pay yeah. 71000 was I, that well, would make sense to me. Because to your point, but a lot of professions, there isn't a lot of inf detailed information about that profession. And I'll tell you, just yesterday, the day before, I was in working with the audiologists and really uh, 
really amazed at the complexity of their profession. And I can't tell you how many now we can count, but maybe 200 tasks that we have for that profession. And more knowledge, knowledge, there's always more knowledge that goes with the task. But I mean, the, the, the detail at which an occupational analysis, the way we do it, is, is very unusual. And it's not usually the same with a national. And it can be helpful for a lot of things. I can't guarantee for that purpose. May, may I ask, are, are there other states that do this that have such a requirement? Um, all sta any licensure exam is required to meet um, professional standards and guidelines. I don't know if other states have a requirements built into their, their regulatory entities. Okay. Most other states use national exams and they don't have a division like OPES within because California is large and, and has a lot of regulatory agencies we have our own division most um, most other states use national exams they don't always get reviewed they can hire an outside firm to do a, an audit if they have problems may I ask Sean Sean have you had experience with other states who that have uh, had a process like this no, we. When I saw this on the agenda, um, it, it. I mean, quite honestly, that caught us off guard because we have never had this happen before, um, in terms of any state coming forward and indicating that a separate state-specific practice analysis would need to be done. That said, um, one of the things that we thought you may want to consider is NBCOT is involved in our practice analysis study as we speak. Um, and as you indicated, we do ours every five years. So this practice analysis, unlike our earlier discussion, uh, is related to entry-level practice. And this study is um, one in which if the board would want to consider this, we, I think, would be willing and able to do this. And that is that we could build out an additional component to the study, meaning that we could factor in more um, individuals, California more California-specific individuals into the study. That could then be used to bring forth data, unique and specific to California. Um, we would then provide you the data that is gleaned from that carve out. Um, we are in the middle of our own study now and therefore we are funding this entire initiative. So there would be no additional cost to the board. Um, the other thing is, is that because we are in the middle of this study, uh, that could be done much quicker. Um, in terms of the timeline that Heather you outlined with the budget and the and uh, the implementation and so forth. So that's you know something that, that could be considered, but we've never seen this before in any other jurisdiction. And I've been with NBCOT for 20, almost 24 years, and I can tell you that in no other state have we ever seen this, and I'm certainly not familiar with any other jurisdiction that has this as a requirement. Um, in the review of the national exam, the occupational analysis is um, is mentioned. Can you review that exam without doing your own occupational analysis? No, we can't do the linkage study part. We can't. We can't do, okay, yeah. so because if if the board wanted to go the direction of seeing what NBCOT could present with this additional data for California, I'm guessing that would come in a report. That data. Yeah, the data. <laughs> yes, okay. So it would. Then, yeah. then they. Um, then is there any way we could tie that back to the exam review? I don't think that would meet the requirements for BMP one thirty nine. Um, it may be down the road if they, but not for you need a you need a California based occupational analysis done with only California subject matter experts, and the way to do that is for OPS to do that. It, you may be able to do that down the road once we've identified maybe the California specific in the future you could add that into your um, survey but I feel at the beginning we need to do have a one that's strictly based with California licensees we do look when we evaluate the national we look to see how many California practitioners participated if they got the good response rate from 
California, because typically California has more practitioners for na in, in national licensure than, than any other state. And California is unique, and we are very, um, we're regulatory um, oriented, as you guys know, and we, are, we also are unique in, in the requirements for examinations. We have very strict standards and licensure requirements for examinations, as you heard. And I have worked with, I worked 14 years with uh, um, a contractor state license board and went to, um, attended their national um, association meetings with all the different states licensure boards. And they really needed us there because we were the only ones who were experts at licensure examinations. And we were working toward a national licensure exam for our contractors. And um, I did a lot of educating of all those other states of what's required because they really didn't understand that national, and in the past, national exams didn't always do occupational analyses. They would just put together a test, and there's a lot of steps that can be missed, and I want to commend your national for doing the process. And I believe that because we stepped up and started reviewing and auditing these national exams, they have improved their practices because they know they're going to be audited and they say well we better they know what they're supposed to do they don't always follow it because it's expensive and like time and labor and, um, intensive and um, because we've started reviewing them they've stepped up and so I think it's important Could I, just a couple more questions if I if the board so move um, Sean when is your practice analysis going to be done the one you're currently in, involved in sure so the um, final analysis uh, would be reflected, if you will, sort of the end game. It would be reflected on the 2019 examination. No, when would you be able to report to this board? Oh, would you see yourself timing? in 2017? I'll be very specific about where my questions are going. It's sure. twofold. You would identify that it was on the sun, that this is very often asked on the sunset review. It was, it, and I imagine that it is, and it, and I would be interested to know um, how the legislators would view the national exam, but today is not that day because we just had our sunset review and we're four years out from being asked that question, of which we were not asked that question this time. So we, from a timeline standpoint, there's that, and then specifically we don't have your data. I'm trying to frame it as we think about where if we need to make a decision today or if we really just move this to a future agenda item, we'll sure. get more data. Yeah. And I, I, to be perfectly honest, I cannot give you 100% assurance on exactly when it could be provided, mm -hmm. but I believe that it could be provided by the end of the year. And the reason I say that is because I think in terms of our, the study that we are involved with, those findings, those initial findings, I think we'll be um, at a point in the fall um, where we will then take the next step in, in the phase of the, of the practice analysis. So I think by the end of the year the data could be provided, but you know, I just want to emphasize that I would have to double check that and make sure. So that there is a timing issue and the, the perfect timing is when the national finishes their occupational analysis, practice analysis, that's when soon after that we want to come in with our updated California-based to compare so we're at, on the same time frame or at least within a year or two. We don't want to be five years out because they'll, they'll be outdated. So you're in, you're in a good window if, even if you, have, if you have to go through the BCP, do the occupational analysis, at least you'll be within a couple of years of if theirs is done in or, you know, late 17, 18, Ours will be done, we could be auditing, reviewing in, in 19. My, my only thought though is I know that we couldn't utilize this offer, potential offer for expanded, you know, polling of our occupational therapists, but it might be interesting since they're willing to offer it, that if, if we you know, do a, what the code requires and um, budget to have you do it, to have that expanded current, and then that way you can do a comparison with a broader pool from the national to see if there are any anomalies between what you find in your research and they find that maybe the way questions are phrased that we ultimately end up with a better outcome on the initial um, report. 
that would that would be my only thing is I don't know that you know we don't have that opportunity I would imagine very often somebody offering to provide would that be helpful do you think it, it could be we, we could discuss that as part um, of the project we can and, talk to them and you you your the occupational uh, analysis that you would perform would uh, include advanced practices and uh, advanced uh, you know experienced practitioners that would not be just the, the, the entry level we survey focus that, that uh, yeah. has. We, we, serve, we, we survey the entire population with an emphasis on entry level. So we over survey entry level people to make sure we have entry level perspective, but we survey the entire um, experience levels of the population. What sample sizes do you, do you look do you Well, how many do you know how many practitioners? 16,000? You have 16,000. Okay. So we would do what we call a stratified proportional sample and we oversample um, people licensed zero to five years and then the other um, so that would be um, 30 or 40 percent and then we do less sampling and we sample by uh, county so we get the um, breadth of California practice and but we 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 always get um, more entry level responses because of the way we do our sampling but we think it's important to have experienced practitioners as well. We have, you know, there's people who are involved with educating um, your your practitioners, and they are usually licensed many years. So we have them, and they have a, a stake in entry level practice. So we involve, involve them in the process as well. Yes, yeah. well, I'm just I'm, I'm trying to make the connection, and I I find, I'm just maybe you could help me. Um, why this is so unique to California to have this need versus all the other states to have this specific requirement on this of the state of California? And if I hear you correctly, it's strictly just because of um, how California is, is the, yeah, how. Well, California is a leader in licensure. Uh -huh. um, I don't, maybe you know, <laughs> do you know that? But right. we, we're the largest state, we have the most practitioners, mm -hmm. and we used to have all of our own pretty much state-based exams, all developed in at DCA. And gradually, the, the need, the industry need for people to move from state to state and have more portability with their licensure, that <coughs> boards and bureaus within DCA started using national exams. But that's a relatively recent thing. And so all, um, initially, all, almost all the exams were developed in, um, at DCA. And um, it, it's, we've become, you know, we are nationally recognized as um, experts in licensure. I have, you know, we have staff who are hired to other outside vendors because of their expertise, and particularly in occupational analysis, because it is something that isn't done as much as it needs to be because it costs a lot of money and it's hard to recoup the costs. They can recoup the cost of exam development by charging the candidate the fee, but the costs, as you see, for the, the occupational analysis are very hard to recoup. So I, that's always been one of California's um, ex, expertise areas. Thank you. So if I could just come back to the question of sample. So if you do 30% of 16,000 that you're surveying, I, I think that's what I heard you say. Well, I meant 30% of our sample would be um, licensed five years yeah. or less. We work with the board to determine the sample. If the board has um, email addresses, we can sample more. Um, if they don't have email addresses, we still do an online survey. We send out a letter to practitioners and ask them to go online and fill out the survey. And it's up if the board, it's, it's, um, the board can sample all practitioners if they want to, which just means sending out a letter to everyone. Where so, I'm going with yeah. this is, yeah. NBCOT, how many, you know, who's sampling a larger number of Californians in their involving more Californians in their practice analysis? Would it be the PES process or the NBCOT process? It's a, you know, it's a question I have. Well, our, we would, ours would be all exclusively California, so. Um, and because we, um, the goal is to get a representative sample by county, even if we don't, we don't sample everyone, we're still getting a representative sample of practitioners. And by definition, the national needs to sample all the other states, and they probably get too many, you know, some national might get too many responses from California. But by definition, a national exam has to cover content that is, um, that is, or practice that's performed across all states. 
And anything that people say, well, we do this in California, they say, well, what the rest of the people in the group say, well, we don't do that in our state. Well, we can't test people on it if it's it's only done in California or only done in a couple states. By definition, that would not make for a valid national exam. So national exams, by definition, have to um, test people on things that are the same across all the states. Whereas when we look at California, and people obviously sometimes don't know this, but when we start looking at their practice, and when we compare it to the national, they're like, oh, we had no idea that they weren't doing this in other states. I mean, they knew that it wasn't on the national exam, but they said, we didn't know that those things were only in California. Sometimes there's a very large um, body of knowledge for um, architects. A, a lot of our boards have a California-specific exam. It's not just laws and regs. It's practice-specific areas that are specific to California. Architects, um, other ones. So Psychology. Thank you again. Thank you for answering all these questions in your time. So, Heather, do you have a direction for the board at, at this point, what we can actually do with this? Um, I would like to bring back some more information, and I would ask that the board table this because this really was on the agenda as a presentation. Um, and so I, I just feel like in the interest of giving additional information as well as being compliant, with the Open Meetings Act, if we could push this off to June, and then I think you all would have enough uh, information to actually make an informed decision. So perhaps, yeah, I just wanted to add one comment to be included in the minutes going forward from perspective, and I know the budgetary line, I have the approval and the subject to all that. To give perspective, our budget is about $1.3 million on average over the last four years. Um, this would represent a 5.5% increase to any one given year. And by comparison, our licensing program is only 8% of our budget. Our administration program is only 8% as well. So I just wanted to make sure that, that impact is realized over the course of the next few years where they have the back and a half on our licensing going forward. So I just want to put those numbers in there so it's in the minutes. Thank you for doing that. Do we have any other public comment before we move to table this to our future agenda item? Mr. Conway, you'll be back in June, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> Are you moving to California? <laughs> You're on the frequent visitor program. Um, thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you for your coming. We very yeah. much appreciate it. Thank you. Very informative, yeah. You're very informative. We really appreciate the knowledge. Okay, with that item, um, it is now currently 104. We are going to we are going to go back to item agenda item number eight, and that specifically is consideration of possible action on legislation to license athletic trainers. Uh, Heather, if you could give us some background on this agenda item when you're ready. Thank you for your help. <laughs> okay, so um, as you recall, that there have, the board has reviewed uh, legislation in past years where the athletic trainers were seeking licensure, and um, as more time has passed, they went from uh, the state of California and went from one of a couple of states that didn't uh, license athletic trainers and now there is only one state that does not license athletic trainers and that happens to be California. Um, and so uh, recently uh, Mike Chassar with the Athletic Trainers Association of California <coughs> is here to answer any questions you might have because as you can see from your meeting materials um, you do have a copy of the bill that introduced licensure for athletic trainers. There's a number of other things they have. Um, there's an organization very similar to what you're familiar with as the NCCOT. There's the board certification. Um, I included their recent uh, practice analysis. I included their um, education competencies. Um, also, there are scopes of practices included in here for the athletic trainers in the states of Florida, Illinois, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania and Texas. Um, and there's a sample uh, statutory language for um, Texas recently enacted it in September of 2015. And there's a document that um, has been actually before this board several times in the last 10 years, and that's the changes in the health um, care profession scope of practice uh, because of sometimes the uh, um, uh, 
efforts by licensure boards to protect their scope of practice without really recognizing that when there is overlap, they can they can still coexist for lack of better word. And so the uh, oh, so sorry. So the one the handout today was um, the bill that in the top right hand corner says March 3rd, 151. Um, the reason this said bill was additionally provided was, it's my understanding, and I can speak to this more, that the one that was provided in the materials that was mailed to you was the Assembly Bill 1510. Um, once the bill was put into print, it was determined by the Athletic Trainer Association that some of the items that they had requested either they weren't in or that the council was not sure when they were um, crafting the bill. And so some of the language from the prior year version of the bill was put in, even though they didn't submit that this time. And so those um, notes are actually uh, included in handwriting on the one that's dated March 3rd. So just a couple of things. OK, I when I read this the first time, it was two states. Which state just? Have this? Alaska was the last one. Alaska was the last one, so we are the last one. Um, is there, would you like to start by making any, any comments before the board? Um, I just appreciate the opportunity to be here again. I came to visit with you a few years ago in uh, LA, so I appreciate your time. I appreciate um, all the work. I was very thorough in putting all that information together, so thank you. And, um, we met a few weeks ago to kind of clarify some information. So I appreciate um, your time. Obviously, you have lots going on um, to deal with with your board. So I appreciate the time answering questions. Um, Are there questions by this board? Uh, I can. Um, I can start off. I have a couple questions. Specifically regarding, um, go back to the reading, go back to mine. When you uh, outline, when you outline the consistency and the makeup of your board, and what, the, what you're specifically asking is to become a committee under this particular board, correct? For our public viewing. So how, when you look at that, Specifically, you've outlined the different types of board. Are you, are you as a group? Let's. Um, I can do this both ways. The meaning. Most of my questions are to go to a place of trying to understand. Uh, well, let me ask a question. Then, I'll, are you open to changing the makeup of that board? So, for example, let's say it was two. Let's say it was a separate committee that had two occupational therapists, one OT, one OTA, two physicians, two athletic trainers, increasing a public member. Or, if that were to be a board, let's just say it was this board, and there were four additional positions, of which there was one public member, two uh, athletic trainers, and one physician. <coughs> Is your uh, association open to that? I mean, I think if, I mean, I can't answer yes or no for, you know, speak for the association on those types of specifics. I mean, certainly we're open to discussion. Um, and I don't think that the model that was presented, you know, in the language is something that we're tied to. I think there's lots of things that aren't in the language, as, as Heather pointed out. And, we had our legislative day last week, and so some of the consultants said, you're missing little administrative pieces here and there. So obviously, we're, we're open to working on a model that would work um, for you and for us. Um, and when you are identifying, specifically going to the scope of practice, let me draw, let me go back to my notes. Sorry about that. Are you... The practice of athletic training includes all of the following, which is on page 5 of 6 for where I'm going. So if we could just go through those, just for the purposes, because we have many public members here as well as these. What does injury or illness prevention look like in the athletic trainer? 
world. So it would somewhat depend on the setting. It may be uh, you know, something as simple as preventative taping if you're working with an athlete. Uh, it could be preventative exercises you know, after the physical examination for um, an athlete. Um, we might look at what there's limitations in strength, the range of motion, or flexibility. Um, so it might be that. It might be. Um, I know we have a, a number of athletic trainers who work at Boeing with the guys putting the planes together. Um, so I know in that setting they've worked on doing uh, kind of dynamic warm up activity when they go to work. So it look like a lot of different things depending on the setting that you're in. So in the example of Boeing, there's that's not an athlete. Correct. That is a person similar to the field of practice. Um, well, I'll let the people who practice in occupational therapy speak up to that. Baba. <laughs> Ergonomic, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's, all right. So it's not just Although it's written in the language athletic, there are people practicing where it's not just the athlete, correct? Is that right? And, and I think, you know, the scope, it isn't specified athlete at all. Um, in about, a, so in our education, um, all athletic training students work with a variety of individuals, not just what we would typically call a traditional athlete. Um, about so I just kind of looked at the numbers um, earlier today. This might come up, and about a third of our members work um, in different settings with you know, kind of non-traditional athletes. Um, in California, we have um, a large number of athletic trainers who work down with the Navy SEALs, work down at Camp Pendleton, um, with recruits there. Um, so we're working with again. The term we're using here is physically active individuals, and that individual who's, again, a Marine recruit is doing things that are very similar to what our traditional athletes are and sustain similar injuries. Um, so we have people that work with you know, Cirque du Soleil, companies like that. We have individuals working with other performing arts um, groups, and we have athletic trainers working with physicians as well. So there are different settings. Please fire. Um, there's another one, not so much in California, but we do have some. Um, again, people that are in physically demanding jobs um, that suffer injuries that are similar, mm -hmm. um, and their employers are deemed that we can do you know, a variety of things that we would consider athletic training services, including prevention being one of them. Also, the other thing that I noticed in reading about, and I would, I would just to understand the clarity around this, as an athletic trainer, a large, um, let's say you are an athletic trainer on a team that travels across state lines, which is very often the case. As it relates to this board, what, what, um, what's the, regula the regulatory process around it? Now there's currently none. But what would happen in the future? Because we, you know, we've just looked at telehealth language. I guess I'm trying to understand it's probably best for our administrator to. So in most states, not a few states are silent on it. In most states, because of the nature of our jobs, especially traditionally, um, that this is an issue. Um, most states have exemption language in their statute that specifies that as an athletic trainer, you can come in to the state not be subject to our licensure laws if you meet certain criteria. So in eight states, that's that you're licensed in your home state. So that's an issue for California athletic trainers right now. And then it's usually you know, a specified amount of time where they may specify that you can only work with your team and the traveling party. Uh, so it's kind of a, a limited exemption for a period of time each year. Some states say, hey, X amount of time every year is the most and again, just in terms of understanding, um, I appreciate that you're going to humor me on what might be um, a question that seems straightforward to you, but really trying to understand the practice of athletic training. Um, if you were a trainer on a traveling team and you came to a different state, is there ever a practice where you would pick up a few jobs on the side because you're in California? Do you, do you understand? No. Do you have? Practitioners who advertise their services when they're with 
or are they solely with that traveling team? They were, were with that team. I, mean, we, I can't say that there are no athletic trainers that you know do things on their own, but it would be in the state that they're, because everybody else in the state that they're regulated. They're not going to come over here if they're not regulated. And we work. Again, well, now they point, can, unless, of course, right, we regulate we tie, them. Once we tighten that up. But 99% of the time, you know, we're working for an employer for way over 50, 60 hours a week. The opportunities to do that are small. Mm -hmm. The free time for exactly. If somebody comes in here for, let's say, you said there's a limited period uh, provision in some places for someone coming into the state. So someone's here for two weeks and there's a, there's a limited period of two weeks where they can practice and someone gets injured or there's a malpractice issue within that first two weeks. Uh, and then, how is that different from a malpractice issue that happens in week three or week four? I mean, I don't really quite get that, how it, from the consumer protection part of that. So you're talking, I'm trying to understand your question. So you're talking that if, they're in the if, state, we go, if we're going somewhere else. No, if you're in the state. Or if you're in California. And, and you have somebody, <laughs> It's an issue with, to me, whether, it seems to me it's an issue whether it's the Wednesday after you arrive or Wednesday six months from now after, you know, you're beyond whatever period. Right. And so, like I said, some states are silent on that, and so there's no period of time. I mean, essentially, you're violating the Practice Act of that state and practicing illegally. I mean, when you violate that, that essentially puts you at, I would think, increased risk of liability. Yeah, you're the only person can answer that. Um, I think that maybe I understood your question differently than he did. Um, I thought that you had asked, what if someone's in California for X amount of time and their period of time passes? Well, the way it's currently written, um, if you look at the very last page of the thing, uh, it's 2697.13. It gives certain, or, uh, certain exceptions to licensure. So it doesn't have time limitations. Like for example, A says, an athletic trainer licensed, certified, or registered in another state or country who is in California temporarily traveling with a team or organization to engage in the practice of athletic training for, among other things, an athletic or sporting event. So if something happens outside of the scope of that reason that you're here, then you would be unlicensed activity. Does that make sense? And is that your question? Yes, and it's just unlike okay. what we do for occupational therapy, where you can't set foot in the state and perform occupational therapy well, we if you're not licensed or even so you have the sponsor free health care? Yeah, so there, there are some minor exceptions. Limited, yes, limited. But. The way I was also understanding it, say they were in here for a sporting event, and the athletic trainer was negligent in providing their service. Mm -hmm. And the athlete doesn't realize the, the, in, the injury evolves as a result of the injury that happened six months ago, but now it's at a point where it's critical and the person feels that the event that took place when they were permitted to be here actually in the long term ended up uh, displaying itself some future point. How do we as a board deal with the person who traveled in? How do other states do it? So that would be the state that It would be the state where they possess the license. Mm -hmm. That would be the, the entity responsible for that okay. kind of conduct. All right. That's a good question. So I need to take, just take that step back to help me understand. I guess my first question, is there any fiscal implications if they're under occupational therapy board? Second, mm -hmm. What does that look like to be under the Occupational Therapy Board? Do we do then regulations for athletic trainers regarding consumer protection? Because they're going to have their own board. I guess there's a big gap for me. Like, what does that mean to be under a board, somebody else's board? What, what does that entail? Um, so in, within the Department of Consumer Affairs, there are a couple of other um, boards that have committees under them. And one of them, for example, is the Dental Hygiene Committee. Is a committee underneath the Dental Board. Okay. okay. So that... Um, the, what's interesting about them, then the other one is the Osteopathic Medical Board and the, and the Naturopathic Committee. So what's interesting though is that even though it says a committee under the board, that it really functions like its own board. It's named committee, but it functions the same. It has its own laws, it has its own regs, it has its own staff, it has its own EO, it has its own budget. I mean, it, everything is distinctly different in the committee under the board structure. So how does that impact our board? If you're underneath, if they're underneath, I, I mean, I don't see this as problematic, but we're asking all these questions, so I just kind of, I mean, what is problematic about a board that's being under, I mean, I'm just going to ask the question, what, 
what's the problem? I mean, yes, he's going to say that. I mean, of course. I just, I, I just, I mean, we have this discussion, did I miss it? I mean, I want to know, I want to be informed. I'm just having a hard time. I, I, I just see it as an opportunity to establish a great relationship with our colleagues. I know as an OTA fighting so hard, we had a certification. We didn't get licensure. We had to fight so hard for that. The OTs had it long before the COTs did. So I understand the need to have that licensure. I get it. Um, and I think it's a great partnership, and I see it's a wonderful opportunity to do things together. So in my head, I, I'd like to hear the counter argument. Like, where, where is it? Bring it, bring it at me. I'm ready to, to digest it and work through it, but I just. So, sorry. I have one question about that uh, along the same lines, and that is with the, uh, the, the whole North Carolina decision thing where the board is liable for, uh, you know, for anti-competitive uh, activities that it, it, it puts forth. And if there's a committee under the OT board and how, you know, then they're not se completely separate the separate boards, would this board, you know, just, would the, an act of the committee Reflect on you know, create a liability issue for the members of the board. That was my question, and I, I have I don't, we don't really have an answer. I don't think that it would because basically they have a separate committee and they're the ones making the decisions. So basically, if they be if, if, yeah this exactly because they're the ones who are making the decision, not OT. The OTs who are on that board would <laughs> are on that committee would have issue, right. but yes. but not the members of this particular board. And, um, and um, if I may, to Sharon, to your point, asking these questions, um, because there are some of the um, administrative framework mm -hmm. is missing from the bill, mm -hmm. I can tell you that the Department of Consumer Affairs, I've been asked by both the folks in the Legislative and Regulatory Affairs um, Division, as well as the Budget Office, to provide some <coughs> information because there are some who, based on the way the bill is written, are assuming that while there would be structure-wise this committee, that any of the workload, including developing the regs, including processing those initial applications, would be assumed by the OT board. Now, I don't agree with that, but I'm telling you there are those who said that because it's, it's that piece is missing, mm -hmm. that that is something that, you know, that they are taking a look at. And so I just, that's very recent, I share that. I was so actually know. going to bring that up, um, because basically I'm looking at the National Catholic Medicine Committee's um, Practice Act, and actually their statute does provide for the committee may employ other officers and employees as necessary to discharge the duties of the committee. The athletic trainer statute doesn't have anything like that. So basically, right, the way it's currently written, the board, or Heather, and for staff would be tasked with handling all these things. I mean, the, the proposed statute does say, you know, the committee's responsibilities include doing regs, approving programs for education and training, investigating the applicants, doing licenses, uh, renewals, and denials. It says the committee, but if you're not gonna put in statute, that you can hire people, then you can't hire people. Right. So if they're going to be under the board right now, the way it's written, the burden would be borne by OT. So hopefully you guys OT can get staff, that. not our OT board. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. Because yeah, so it looks like there's some overloaded. So Go this goes to the point where we're trying to create efficiencies and not create additional boards, which would mean additional, you know, uh, staff that the existing staff would be expected to do the functions for that committee like they would for the board the way it's and written. currently written um we would get some revenue out of it i think the way it's structured the licensing fees right but i would hope that they would expand at least heather's staff to accommodate the additional responsibility because you'd have to there's just know, how many athletic trainers do we currently have that we think would be just under 30. right so you'd have a you know, just about a 25% increase, 20, 23% increase in um, total licensees within the board. So, um, uh, you know, and yeah, and then I think I think the reason that they want to, I, I'm not sure. I know you went to a couple other boards at one point. And, you know, uh, I don't know how we ended up as the lucky ones. I mean, I'm not being facetious, but I know that there was talk with the you know physical therapy. I think. Physical, uh, physical therapy, I think, was one that you had looked at, and a couple others. Um, you know, is it because you think we have more overlapping practice issues, so it meets, you know, this idea that our, 
part. Though we may not be our, our uh, I think it's more distinct differences, if I may. You see us as having more distinct differences. Is that what it is? Lab. We've never talk, actually talked to anybody else. Okay. You know, um, committee staff thought, oh, maybe oh. the PTs, and okay. you know, we have the same sorts of issues. And we didn't say no right away, so that's why we <laughs> 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 well, you know, uh, was interpreted as a yes. Yeah. You know, but with this, to the point about clarification, where I'm, I'm losing on where the assumption is is that it would fall on this board. I recognize that there's going to be an OP on there, board, but there's also going to be some of the medical board. So I'm trying to follow where the assumption is that the committee would fall directly under That's a the OT course. Yeah. Because it's not on the one. It's not. It is. Is there a it's, yeah, it's, yeah I'm, I'm using both the one that I have before yeah. and the one that I just received. But yes, it does say it's, 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 it's within the board of right. right. yes. right. The definition is on page two and it says and, the board specifies. And that's why I asked if they were open to the committee. Right. Because when it, when it was within, but I guess just a couple things to to shadow some of the comments that Sharon Pavlovich made because I come from the same position and it really ends up being the way of the board in terms of which direction we go. But if I start from a place of, of thinking, well, that's interesting. I, I That's interesting where it's going because you have already come up with the funding. I want to put that out there, correct? You are going forward whether it's this board or not, right? With the, I mean... But if this board turns you away, you're going forward for licensure, right? I would think so. Okay. Right? But this I don't really have the option of turning them away. It's, it's, a, a, it's a proposed bill. I know that. Well, so that, that, was, my next, to that was my next question. Well, no, no, no. That, my next question was uh, if we have that option. But, but importantly, what I want to understand, and I want you to know what we, for me as a practitioner, taking off the. I already know where I stand in the regulatory piece, but as a practitioner, it was always going to come down to scope of practice for me. Um, scope of practice, that being differences, as well as the administrative functions. Nothing that would come in harm to this board of occupational therapy, mm -hmm. protecting the consumer, protecting the practitioner. I'm not completely satisfied with the scope issues, only because my background is ergonomics, number one, <coughs> it stands out big. That, that, but again, in the interest of backing off and not sounding self-serving or where Richard Bookwater was going, because it's not meant like the North Carolina thing. It's just meant, meant to say, does our language, I mean, certainly everybody has some element, PT practice and injury prevention too. It's not like OTs own it. But is there some element where, where there's a clear delineation between who does what? So, so I'm still waiting for that to to totally be satisfied in certain practice scope areas. Others are very clear in here. The second thing, and that's even bigger, this new news about the administration, that, that how, how come that wasn't in your language? How did that not happen? Just not the experience on that end. So how could we, now that it's in here, we may not have a choice, I guess I'm looking to, how we, would we fix this? What does this look like? What's the theory? You can amend this, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can right. So I, I, I mean, yeah, I think that you would request them to ask the author to make the amendments. Okay. Um, so there's so our action item. Right. There. We have all these amendments already. Because again, this, what is reflected in here in scope is what we worked on with OTAC three or four years ago um, that never saw the light of day because we <coughs> title protection, so all the scope came out. Um, but we had agreed with this language and we felt it was. Pertinent proof and put it back in. Um, and I think it did do things to help tighten up so the overlap wasn't as apparent and we weren't delving into areas that we don't necessarily like. We're not going to go work and just net for a rehab. So You're being rotation. webcast, by the way, so we'll have you on tape saying that. <laughs> <laughs> we earlier, just to be clear. We had an earlier conversation where we were looking at the dental dental hygiene board or committee under the dental board as being a model. Now, does that board have an, an executive officer, yes. a second executive officer for the committee in addition to the main executive officer? Yes. So if that's the model, why is that not? Uh, why well, is there no mention of an executive yeah, oversight? Officer? Right, it's an oversight, and that will be taken care of. And certainly, um, the intent on our part was never to saddle you with a 32 licensees to deal with, with the existing staff. And we had the language about 
and the finances, the finances would cover the costs. Yeah. Presumably, in our minds, that also meant the staff might be paid. That's what the cost would be. So the implication was there about the specifics. Right. So again, we've heard a few things. And, and it's interesting, too, that we've gone through a couple of iterations of this over the years. And every time you hear different things in the language um, that it is we recommend, and I think, you know, being later to come into licensure in California, so we can take language from different places uh, and utilize that to craft a bill where those loopholes and those things that we get tripped up um, but sometimes don't exist. Yeah, I'd like to recommend, if you don't mind, that um, that the board um, comes up with a list of things that they think are missing from the statute, the way it's currently, or you know, the statute with the proposed legislation, so that um, the board can give it to you you, I suppose, and they so can kind of get these in there. Because otherwise, I mean, I really don't know. The board would need to take a position on the bill as it is. You know, maybe it would be opposed unless amended with these amendments. Um, and I would add tweaking it. Yes, and I would support the amendment. I'm sorry. And I would like to okay. further add on to that, if I may, given that um, I would like to further add on to that, given that we know it is in legislation already and it could happen. That if our if our association is is so moved to help on the scope of practice issues, uh, some of your concerns. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to speak now? Right. Yes, Do you have speak. any comments? By the way, I I'm always with comments. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is now the time, President? Um, yeah. I first of all, on behalf of Votech, yeah. we would like to say uh, you know congratulations again for the step again. Uh, we have been in support of you in the past because of all reasons we were in support of our own board because we think life's a good idea, of course, in the interest of, of consumers, etc. cetera. Um, however, our current leadership was uh, concerned about the language and its current form. Um, if I'm, you know, I, forgive me, but if the way I read this, uh, the idea of any phrase like, or a condition exacerbated while participating in physical activity, I think if any of us takes a brisk, any of us in the room takes a brisk walk to a student union, we're going to have an exacerbation due to that physical activity of some type, right? So I, it's a little broad. Um, I chose actively not to submit our statement letter yet on our stance, but I can tell you it's leaning toward we're asking for amendments. Um, so yes, I think, I can't speak to what you alluded to earlier, um, and I'm sorry, I should really be addressing the board, forgive me. Um, I can't speak to what was said earlier about what OTEX passed is and collaborating with the athletic trainers. I just know that we were supportive of the bills. I don't know what the work was on the language. I know that we currently, looking at this language, are very concerned about the detailed education that an occupational therapy practitioner possesses, allowing him or her to do a number of things that that we feel is truly our scope and different than what you're proposing is your scope. Yes, there's, there's some overlap, but we do feel like there's an absence of distinction that leaves us very concerned um, regarding this bill as currently written. Yes. So we really would like to see significant amendments made and would be open to collaborating in that process. And I, you know, um, thank you for that. And I also, I think what's interesting and what could potentially come out of this given uh, is that we could Put an ad hoc committee together under our practice committee specifically with the language and we would ask the association for various members that you might suggest that would really work on that because really what we're looking for is um, is a clear delineation of scope of practice so that it's clear also what's been brought to my attention and that was a question that we had is what about your disciplinary guidelines where is that going to be part of your amendment as well? It's not as clear as our as our scope or our practice act on what you do to discipline. Are, are you aware of that? Um, yeah, we pulled some of this language from other locations, so we should have pulled ours. Yeah. Make <laughs> <laughs> clear. Coming, you're coming to us. Pull not, not all boards have disciplinary guidelines. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. In itself. Oh, okay. Okay. The only okay. thing to what I think okay. everybody said here is you've got a legislative calendar that's mowing, moving ahead. Correct. And it sounds like there's a couple of groups. What it, you know, 
what is your appetite for this and how quick could we do these things? Because it's obviously we're not going to be able to do that in this setting today. Um, and we're not trying to, but no, today's the first discussion of the full board around this to really vet these things that concern us. It's already out there, so we need to vet these things that concern right. us, find out if you're open to it, and from our standpoint, right. put something together that will come back to this group and work I'm, through the fine details. I'm just saying that if we wait to our next board meeting, there will not be the the date for amendments, and it yeah. I think will be sale past. Well, so. I think we're doing an ad hoc. Okay. That's what I just yeah. Okay. I think I'm proposing that. By the way, proposing that. I'm glad that you, Mr. Miller, and Emily, you brought up because I think the guidance would help. Because I have not seen this Yeah. So the action before us today is really to put together an ad hoc. Um, really look at, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think that would be um, best. I believe in my conversations, um, Mike, that the intent is to um, collect some suggested edits so that they can approach the author with, you know, a laundry list of edits rather than going several times. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that the um, last week in April is the last day to be heard in the committee. And by the way, on the website, it does say that it may be heard as soon as March 21st. So um, again, I think that they can always go to the author's office and ask for that to be rescheduled. But um, again, in the Very interest of time. Um, yeah, but you would be less likely to go and ask them that and more likely, because you're, as uh, board member Bookwalter, or excuse me, Farrell said, the, the, this is already moving forward. What I think, have you, so in terms of today, what we might identify for you, I think it's clear, um, again, not speaking for the board, any board member can stop me, but um, specifically, if you are looking for information today, I think the disciplinary guidelines are huge. I think the delineation of scope of practice, we can put together that opportunity where we'll come back to that, but that's a concern. And I've also heard um, administrative. Mm -hmm. Is there other things that other board members have, you know, in terms of, because the, if it's moving ahead, we want them to know that that's concerns today. And then we can also put an ad hoc committee together. Is there other things that you can think of? Staff is the same, right? Yeah. Should we specify who is appointing the committee members? Should we discuss the committee members? It's on the governor. Yeah, the governor. And now, just I thank you for bringing that up, Viata, because I was curious why you wouldn't just have the governor in our particular board. The governor appoints all the practitioners, and the speaker appoints a public member and the assembly member. Uh, the idea that our speaker and Senate pro tem appoints the public members. Why did you go to that direction? Committee staff. I mean, so much of this gets, I mean, we've been through, I mean, I've been doing this for 10 years, and so much of it gets changed, and you have one committee staff person who believes one thing, one committee staff person who believes another thing. I mean, you go know, process. It's sort of sausage making. So that's where that, so things like that, we're not necessarily tied to. That was the recommendation that was given to us at the time that we just carried over. And then it's that the needs if you want somebody that's OT or not, if it's not specified, or if it's all of them, then... Well, I think they said they were open to the makeup of the committee staff, which was my... Oh. Well, that was nice. Yeah. What else? What else from the public? Yes. Uh, Ada Bloomhurl Practitioner, Occupational Therapy <laughs> Assistant. Um, I, I, again, I, I commend the seeking of, of, of licensure. Um, at, at, I read, however, you know, and I look at this education section, and I, and I see sections on eating disorders and drug abuse and physical agent modalities and the term psychosocial, things that we're not even allowed to use within our scope of practice because of how it um, is in other scopes of practice. So as a practitioner, and I read this, the degree of education, to, it, and the statement of the, any, during the any physical activity, I, um, as a practitioner, feel um, greatly concerned about the breadth and openness 
Yes, I understand the committee's forming, but I would like my ability to express that um, concern of the range of things that to identify people in need of mental health care. I, as a mental health practitioner, that concerns me. Um, thank you for that opportunity. Mike, can you talk about a little bit who you expect your resistance to be on this bill? Uh, I appreciate the collaborative approach that's been mentioned a couple of times and, and the support in this room. I think, uh, personally, I've always felt that whenever I met you with the board or with the association, and board or lobbyists, um, the, the big opposition, as you might guess, are the <laughs> um, And they have historically across the country, as well as um, in California, have been very aggressive and pushing back against us. Um, so there is no opposition letter to date, which is approved by the meeting with their legislative um, chair to try and build a relationship with him. The last time we did this, it took our language immediately before the bill dropped, took it and was were opposing us. And it would just oppose, not even oppose on us. And so um, we really want to work collaboratively. I mean, I think my goal is that athletic trainers work to the full extent of our education, um, just like you do with your practitioners, whether it be OTA or an OT. Um, you'd like to be able to utilize the skills that you're trained to utilize. Um, we certainly don't want to go beyond what we're capable of doing and have been educated to do as well. And you know, I think the, the tightrope act is to have enough specificity that it limits you, but not so much specificity that it limits you. So you know, we're open to working collaboratively with anybody who can help us um, work on that, that language to, to allow us to do what we do without overstepping our bounds. And again, we'll overlap where we overlap, and we won't. Can I ask a question? Of course. Okay. Um, so I'm. This is the first time that I've had a client that's had this kind of situation where I've been going through it with them. So I don't know how the bills get drafted. So do you have staff that handles all this? Do you have an attorney who does this? Uh, we have no office. So that's part of the reason we've been working on this so long. <laughs> Our association. Is us okay. volunteers? Do you have anyone? We have a lobbyist. Person? We have a lobbyist. Are they licensed attorney? Um, I don't think. Okay. There may be somebody in the office. Okay. Is. Because I am not allowed to advise you on this, <laughs> but I do recommend that. that but you are allowed to advise us and guidance from an attorney and yeah. developing on how what's missing and what to add. But you are allowed to advise us, Ileana, and I think you're going in a direction, minus them, you are going in a direction where I was hoping, I, I'm glad you piqued my memory that I wanted to ask that. Mm -hmm. um, if you could also be looking at the language in terms of, I think what will be helpful when we do put an ad hoc committee is if you look at all this language with the question of what does it need to keep us two separate entities to keep our keep us safe, this board safe. Yes, that would be very helpful. Of course. Um, and then there's a couple of other things. Oh, the dental hygienist Heather. Do they have a separate office than the dentist? Yeah. Okay, so it's a separate office. Separate office, separate, separate staff, staff. Yeah, separate, because it's linear budget. I mean, and they have, they have separate legal counsel. However, I will tell you that Osteon Natural shared attorney. I don't know why that is, but it is. Well, that's true. Well, yeah, that's true. Natural only has two employees. So. Yeah. Or maybe 1.5. I'm not sure where they are now, but they're very, very small. The one point to the president of the board has several committees on the same stuff, but it's not under these meetings. Workforce work investment. Workforce work investment. Mm -hmm. How does speech, speech has three different entities, speech, so audio, and hearing. Mm -hmm. Do they have the same staff? It's one board. Yeah, but it's one board. Mm -hmm. Two, two, so it's and not two. the board and the committee. It's right. Speech. One board. All yeah, we're not, we're not going there. So right. 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 we're not going there. I just right. wanted to clarify that. Um, all right. Has everybody's questions been satisfied? Do we, do Heather? Maybe I don't know. Is it, I'm not to put you on the spot because I can try to do it. But do you feel like you have enough in terms to give us a summary of what what we've talked about? Um, 
well, I guess I still need some information about the um, the ad hoc committee. What and when do you envision that? Because the author can ask to have it this bill be heard. I mean, that's how they get on the committee's calendar. The author asks. So if they ask for sooner rather than later, but there's some time to get some changes in, then I don't know why they wouldn't want to. Yeah, yeah. especially if ask for the changes. But if and the people that we're working with want allow that time to happen so that way the partnership can develop because ultimately what we're talking about is a partnership here I think if if they don't that gives us a real clear picture of where our board would want to go in our letter in opposition to the I mean seriously that's what it boils down to I'm gonna be blunt right um, it's really it, we we want to figure out a way where our board is protected but I also would say that if they're gonna be part of our OT board family, we're going to want to make sure that their profession is protected from other Correct. boards and doing, trying to infringe on their core practice, right? Correct. So we've got to figure that out. I think if we're really doing that, you're right, Heather. You know, we need to. Well, let me ask this question then. Ada, would you be on a practice committee? You can say no, and you know I'm very. <laughs> Even though you're being one. <laughs> and, and, and I have no problem being asked. And, okay. and I'm entertaining the idea, but it, I need logistics before I can say yes or no. You're moving to Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. Okay. I know. You're planning my okay. You've been uh, on an ad hoc, just for the purposes, you've been on an ad hoc committee Correct. before. We know the timeline is March 21st. It's probably two and or three, two calls maybe. One call initially that's going to happen very soon, I imagine. Heather, would you be uh, either would you be identifying somebody from OTAC or a couple of people? Could you give us those names? Because we have to come back as a board, Ileana. We have to vote on the ad hoc committee to accept them. Yes, and you can do that today because I think it would. Fit or we could do it tomorrow if she needed time to talk oh, to a couple of people. I'm sorry, I meant at this board meeting, whether Correct. it's today or tomorrow. Okay. Yes. Do you think in the next day you could identify a couple of people as suggestions that could? Okay. Yes, I can. May I ask a clarifying question? And we'll get some logistics around that. We'll answer that as well. Are you here tomorrow? No. Okay. So okay. we'll vote in your, who's your proxy? I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And oh, Bob I left the room on purpose. How funny he is. Okay. He knew where I was going. He, he didn't leave on purpose. It was just, you know, <laughs> timing. Timing is everything. Anyway, I just wanted to share that yeah, we're coming together with the ad hoc committee. But I was looking at the psychosocial strategies. And it does say psychosocial strategies and ad referral. I mean, I, I know this said that. So it's identification of a lot of psychosocial issues, which if you saw in the concussion or if you saw any of those things that have to do with that kind training. It makes sense to me why you would be the steward of being responsibility to look at things that are happening psychosocially. But yet, it says very specifically, and referral. So, um, I don't know. Just for that. Sharon, I'm hoping that you might consider being on the ad hoc. So, I'm hoping too. I'm actually I have to these. No, I also would like, I also um, have talked to Heather, and I'd be willing to participate as well and interested. But I'm, I'm hoping you might as well and maybe even consider chairing it. Um, have you chaired an ad hoc yet? See, you'd be awesome. So whatever the case may be, that's how quickly that's how quickly we can put some together. Is the board so moved that we could come back and revisit tomorrow? And would we be doing a quick vote? You'll let somebody know that you're interested or not. May I ask a question though today before I leave? Of course. Yes. So the outcome goal of the ad hoc is to. They want a laundry list. They want a specific... A laundry list of changes to provide is so effectively the outcome goal of the ad hoc. You specifically would read their scope of practice. Well, you would read the legislative. Right, read okay. seven pages and say, and really look under... Well, the implication is that the board, if the changes were made, that the board would support the bill. Correct. That's the implication. Okay. Thank you for summarizing. Thank you. Yeah. So, does that make... Thank you. Yeah. So if, if you can let it be known to someone and, and we can, and then um, Sharon, you, you certainly can think about it as well, but I think, you know, from the education standpoint and the OTA, I think there's some interesting aspects in there. Um, I do apologize. I keep calling you Bob. He's another friend, but it's Ernie. I know it's Ernie back there. You were my student. Um, Ernie, do you want to participate in an ad hoc at all? 
by chance you can just I'm plant. definitely open to it, absolutely. Okay, great. So there we go. That's how fast it can come together. We'll come back tomorrow to board and revisit it. Do you, does sure. anybody else want to say anything else? Or ask my personal here, right here. Are you, you going to be back tomorrow, Mike? Um, <laughs> tomorrow morning, I'll be busy. <laughs> happiest place on earth. Yes. So, so, so we're the prelude to the happiest place on earth. And just for clarification, that whatever results come from the ad hoc would still be subject to a board full approval. Correct. Presented as a position. Correct. Sure Everybody heard that? Do I say it again? It's saying for clarification that whatever a document was produced out of the ad hoc committee showing our position and whether we're supportive or not supportive of the proposed legislation as amended or not amended, that position paper statement, whatever, would still have to go through the form of review before we would issue it. So we would still have opportunity to weigh in. I didn't ask you. Feel free by all means. You're here. Okay, no. <laughs> I it's good to know. I like definition, yes or no. All right, so. so the, the author's office just, like, just asked, and she's like, yeah, she would like to collaborate and work things out prior to going uh -huh. to committing. So. so that means that they are willing to. I mean, there's five other Tuesdays. I mean, right. before it's that. So, I mean, I feel like she gives The 21st is just statutorily is the 30 days is up. Right. That they theoretically could be. Yeah, they just would have to each each week extend it by a week. Is how they usually do it. But they'd be willing. They do that. So they seem willing to do that. And Eliana, you have it in your ability in the next five weeks to really advise this board specifically on our. Okay. Yeah, I'll see why not. Let me check my calendar. Right yeah. May I, may I, may I ask you uh, re, um, to restate or clarify for me? Did I hear a statement saying the implication is that if the changes are made that we're in support? But then I'm hearing that this still needs to go through. So I'm, it, I'm, I'm a little bit lost and I need that in my thought process. Yeah, so so uh, the board can't take a position on this bill without knowing. I mean, the ad hoc, we just talked about how we need to put, make a list of things that are missing from the bill. And and then, so a committee, and we're not prepared to make that list today. Right. Uh, so we want to have an ad hoc committee to make that list. And but and then that list would come back to this board, and this board would decide to accept that recommendation or not. And take a position. And then take a position at that future board meeting, once the, the list of concerns has been identified. We probably wouldn't be thinking about doing all of that if we weren't prepared to, at the end, Consider, at least consider supporting this bill if those if the, if we if the, the, there are two possibilities at the next board meeting we go through the list we say yeah we're not going to take a position on this bill or we're not going to support this bill but we've already gone through the, the, the implication is that we've identified a bunch of things that we think could change that would make the bill palatable or you know workable for us so the implication is that that we give it to them, they make the changes that we would not oppose the bill or uh, support it. So usually you take the you know you take a position of support if amended or oppose unless amended. And these are the typical kinds of positions you take on a bill. And specifically to add on to that, Ada, if you're specifically because of the timeliness of it, your role on that ad hoc is really the question is to go to the place of what if. And even if you as an individual practitioner disagree with the what if, we would ask you to participate on that ad hoc committee to go that direction. You would still be welcome to come back and give comment as an individual practitioner saying I don't agree with the board, I don't agree with this at all. I was on the ad hoc committee, I went through the exercise, I still did, you're welcome to do that always. But that, the purpose for putting the ad hoc committee together is to go through the process of what if. Thank you. Not to open a double dialogue and a whole, like we don't have the time for the ad hoc right. committee to debate should we do this or should we not. We as a board have already decided that we want you to do this from a what if standpoint. Again, Fair? Yeah. Because you've been an ad hoc chair and then yeah. into that. Yeah. I think the third thing that, we, that Richard did, that, that even if we come back with a recommendation to support if, the author and or the group that's working with the author may not find all of the amendments acceptable. 
so they could come back with some alternative modifications that may not include all the modifications we like. Then, of course, the board would have to meet again, probably, to have some type of input if we need to change our stance, right? That's what we'd have to do. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of work to be done in five weeks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a physical lot. agent modalities are an advanced practice for occupational yeah. therapists. And would we not, would we ask uh, that to be the same level of education, supplemental education and training for athletic trainers in California that, that occupational therapists do? Because, you know, those kinds of things. To protect this, but would also enhance their skill set, right? Or to protect the consumer. Right. right. It's a, you know. mm -hmm. So we'd have to be mindful, uh, adding on to that as well, we'd have to be very mindful from our advanced practice guidelines. And this goes back to what. Richard Bookwater was speaking about regarding North Carolina. It is out of the purview of this board to really um, specifically, we're not looking, we're looking at scope of practice for protection and consumer period. Advanced practice guideline protection and consumer period. Um, that's why, and in California we have a great deal of oversight. We have legal counsel here and we have pretty fantastic public members. So, so that we're not, we're not going down this process by which to say, you know, we want this and we want this for the athletic trainers. We really are trying to get to a better, balanced, right. safe place. Right. Well, and once once the scope of practice for athletic trainers is in statute, then you're kind of relieved of the North Carolina issues. Right. So, um, you know, and just a reminder, I, I'm not state oversight, so. <laughs> So, um, well, you know well, what I you know what I mean. I know, I'm, I I'm not. I know, I mean, I if I misused a word, what I'm really trying to get at is there's another layer of someone giving us input right. that is not just right. you know, that particular right. board voted. It was all practitioner mm -hmm. present that day. Our public members were not there. So, um, not saying that we practitioners would do that, but you know what I mean. We have over. Yes, we have the OAL. Right. Yeah. So okay, have we have we satisfied everybody's comments, thoughts on this issue? Do we know where we're going? Okay, do I have do I have to put any more action item forward? What do we need? I think you're gonna have uh, agenda item eight on the agenda tomorrow, tomorrow so that the ad hoc committee <coughs> can be. <coughs> Thank you so much, Mike, for coming and for all of your openness and willingness to have this dialogue with us. Thank you. Okay, we've already done. You would like a break? Okay. All right, it's two, it's two o'clock. Um, how long do you think you need for, we have three more agenda items. How long do you think those will take? How long are we looking about it? Okay. So let's go ahead and take, um, do you want to, oh, and then we have a full session. So do we want 45 minutes for lunch or do you need an hour? Well, where's close enough for us to eat? There's lots of places to eat. The reason I gave 45 minutes is because you're going to need 15 minutes to stand in those lines. Yeah, plus, it's not up to the lunch hour, so I think the line should help you. Yeah. Hopefully, yes. the food truck is still there. The student union is right across the, the That's where we went for the yeah. start. That's, so, that's, some, that's the is this, you're, do you, you teach here, correct? Me? No. 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 No, nobody has to teach us here. I'm up here as a student right there. How long do you think we need Richard for lunch? Uh, an hour with the uh, lines. Oh, oh, it's 2 o'clock. 45. 40, okay, 45 minutes. Yeah. 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 We'll be back in 45 minutes, 245. All right. So, <laughs> 245. <laughs> Tell them why. Are the two of the same?
California Board of Occupational Therapy. We are um, back from our afternoon break and, and we are currently at San Jose State University. Starting next with item number, agenda item 10, which is the consideration of possible action on adding requirement of ethics course to professional development units completed as a condition of renewal. So Heather, if you want to provide a brief um, one of the things that was mentioned in the 2012 sunset and then also again in the 2016 sunset report had to do with rather than having a um, state specific exam to instead add um, um, at one was about adding um, an ethics course um, at, an attestation. And so instead of uh, that, one other thing that came up was about actually adding the requirement to the PDU requirement. So the board said, what do other healthcare boards do in California? And what do other state boards do? And so you have in here um, some examples first of the California boards, so Board of uh, Behavioral Sciences, Chiropractic Examiners, Hearing Dispensers, uh, physical Therapy and Respiratory Care Board all have language that requires completion of an ethics as part of the continuing education, continuing competence, professional development, whatever the respective board calls it. So you can see they range from two to three hours per renewal cycle. And then the document following, and then I'm so sorry, the last item is the boards um, or bureaus that do not have an ethics requirement set forth in their continuing education regs, and there's a long laundry list of them. And then following the yellow divider are the few, the handful of states that do have uh, an ethics requirement for um, uh, other state OT boards. And in the interest of, of this board's time, if I can just ask, couple of questions. This isn't the first time this has come before us, correct? Um, this, this topic has not. This is the first time that you're having a snapshot of what other boards do. Got it. Okay. And is it back on, is out of the, dis it was out of the discussion of this that we as a board discussed the attestation to be added to the application, correct? About the ethics course. Yes. Basically. And, and we've received word today that we could now do that. We were steered away from that because of this analysis. That's, well, that's slightly correct. So the part is, it's not, the attestation was not for an ethics course. The attestation was, yes, I promise I read the ethical standards the practice ethical standards, in the regs. Right. Um, it was regarding this issue that we said, can we just, just put it in the application? Yes. And then we were steered away from the application because any changes to the application would require a practice analysis, correct? So, so now that that is, it's been clarified by our attorney that we can certainly do that, is that something that can come up in agenda item 10 or does it have to go on a future agenda item? I would, oh, please. Yeah, I, was, I would say that the, the wording, this is specific to adding the ethics requirement to the condition of renewal. Separate. So it's separate. <laughs> okay, so I just would, all I'm asking is that the board be mindful of the fact that we did have a previous discussion where we came to consensus about one of the ways to perhaps look at the ethics uh, piece that, you know, I have taken an ethics course was to add it to the application. I just ask you <coughs> to be mindful that we've had that discussion. Keep it in the back of my, our mind for future discussions. Okay. Thanks for going the distance. <coughs> so what, what do you, would you like to be the action item out of this, Heather? What's the action to the board on this? Well, do you want to add a requirement to the continuing competency requirements as a condition for renewal that individuals have to take a course in ethics? Or in addition to, or do you just want to have the certification or self-certification attestation, however you want to call it, um, that uh, uh, as a condition of renewal, then they check that box as saying, yes, 
I have read the ethical standards of practice, and I understand the ethical standards of practice in, in the sentence, so that in the event that they do something like lie about the PDUs completed, then you go back to the renewal and they said, I promise I read that. I think it's, I think it's interesting because, well, physical therapy is listed as a board that doesn't have it on that last page, but actually there is a physical therapy board the paragraph here uh, where it says, uh, so I think that's an error on the list, but I like the, I'm looking at the language where it says for each renewal cycle, a license for a physical therapy board in California. For each renewal cycle, a licensee's continuing competency hours must include the following two hours in ethics, laws, and regulations, or some combination thereof, which gives you a little flexibility. Is it ethics? Is it law? You know, because we do have, we, I mean, we, uh, Denise and I uh, taught, you know, did a course, I've done a back course at uh, OTAC events. Um, I taught that laws. course, yeah. actually, at a doctoral level, ethics. Um, let me see how it was. Advocacy, ethics, and legal implications. It was that exact title. So. But, or could they just read it and sign off on it? It seems easier. So to me, again, that's why I've asked the question. It seems to me that we've had this discussion and came to some conclusions. So we can have the discussion where we go down the path of re-recommending, re-recommending the attestation added to the application. So the things before us are, do we want them to take an ethics course? And if so, what does that language look like? We don't have that, if we don't have that requirement in there, um, or is there a way to get around that by adding this attestation? <clears throat> My thought would be, if we think we can provide the same consumer protections by just doing the check the box, is that people accountable to actually knowing and meaning and following what it means? versus somebody clearly having to take a course which delineates what is acceptable ethics and behavior under the law, and then definitely knowing. I, mean, that, I know ignorance of the law is not an excuse, but it becomes more ambiguous if we have to discipline somebody based upon something. If, if it's like close, because they, you know, they checked this box, they thought they understood whatever. But I think if, they, if there's a requirement, are we providing greater consumer safety if they have to take that hour, or two hours, or three hours, whatever the combination thereof? I like the idea of having the box and they're at, you know, attesting that they've, um, they've read all the ethics requirements. I like it. I think that covers it. You've been consistent on that issue. <laughs> That's almost exactly how you said it the first time. I see. <laughs> yes. Um, when at Beetle Sacramento City College Occupational Therapy System Program, I, 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 I would support an ethics requirement as part of continuing ed, except <coughs> I would envision people going online just flipping through it and not paying any more attention to it than you know, anything else. I just, I, you know, I, I think in theory, it's nice. In theory, I would like to see if we're going to require that, that if you work in school districts, here's an ethical class you could take that explains, you know, all of the different aspects you have to worry about. If you're working in, you know, outpatient, that we cover the ethics of billing, because it's Medicare fraud and that kind of stuff we worry about. It's, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I think you could go the whole gambit of providing some amazing things um, to us as practitioners. But what I envision would happen is if you require a class, is that a high percentage of people would take an online ethics class, just like they take an online class after they get a driving ticket or something like that, and just whip right through it. And you know, a small percentage might actually you know pay attention and gather some information that changes outlook but in my experience I think it would be small I think you know not that it's saying which way you guys should go but I just think in the real world you gotta be you know honest about the effect it's gonna have. I have do you have that in your curriculum? Oh I'm sorry. I so, do you have that in your curriculum Sharon? And yes. like, we have a leadership and advocacy class where we cover it yes. And do you have that at Cal State to make sales? 
Yes, in our management class. And, and US, also USC. I'm, I'm not sure about USC, but also we have an additional class just in ethics that Laura teaches. Okay, and then does American Occupational <coughs> Therapy Association have, they have numerous courses, I imagine. Is that a fair <laughs> statement? <laughs> Um, they have a whole ethics department. There, there's a, they have a huge ethics department, and the um, incoming chairperson is our own Dr. Ann McDonald out of West Coast University. Mm -hmm. So a, a great resource in our backyard. AOT does have a lot of um, resources <coughs> available, CDs, um, of course, courses at AOTA conference, but there's a lot of CD um, information that one can take on very specific topics. Mm -hmm. And does MBCOT have any in your tools? Do you have anything related to ethics? We don't have any courses, so to speak. But and Pam, I don't know if you want to speak to this in terms of the you know when you're. We're kind of circling back around to the exam blueprints, that sort of thing. Uh -huh. And ethics is is uh, it's cited in, it. in the, the practice analysis. Well, I'm sure AOT has numerous, numerous items. Um, yeah. what, Winifred, did you want to say something? Did your curriculum think it includes ethics? Yes, and uh, Winifred Schultz, Borough Chair of San Jose State University on um, Occupational Therapy, and we do have ethics that's embedded in the coursework. And there's also analysis from the ethics that's done not only in the didactic portion, but also the field work portion. Not just field work level two, but field work level one. Um, wearing a different hat, when you're looking at OTA products, there's an, and just like what was mentioned by both Heather and, and Ada, I think you were mentioning it too, there's numerous pro products from AOTA specifically addressing ethics, mm -hmm. um, along with um, the code of ethics that's generated from the mm -hmm. association. So, wasn't our attestation going to be that they read the Code of Ethics? Wasn't it more specific to that than saying I took an ethics course? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was more for a course, if I remember correctly. It was more it's the understanding to the ethical standards and practice that are set in regs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our ethics, yes. yes. Set in the regs. Okay. I, I was just going to say every employer I have ever worked for has involved Medicare laws and things like that. I have signed an ethics agreement on a yearly basis and uh, employee handbook where all talks all about ethics. So I think I, I I think it's kind of covered pretty good, you know, between the curriculum and, and if all the employers um, that I've worked for are like the other employers in different settings. I've never worked in a hospital setting, but I'm sure that they're they it's have kind of, stuff that you have to sign as well. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there. Do you have a recommendation, Laura, to the board? I just recommend that this. we do the box saying on the, on the application that they have read and understand <coughs> the, our, our um, ethics. What's it called? Ethical standards. Thank you. Ethics and standards. you have the, the code in as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. Anybody else want to make any comments? Um, can, yes, um, Laura would please, and also on faculty. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, in terms of if you go along with, you know, just checking the box and having said that you've read and understood, is there a need, Heather, to say that you also will adhere, or is that an understanding that, you know, of course you wouldn't adhere, or do you need to make that? Explicit. I think it's better to make it explicit, but because either way, the regs do say that if you violate therapy practitioner shall. Those four words are at the beginning of the laundry list of things that you should either shall or read, shall understood, and adhere. Yeah, yeah, it might be a nice reminder. Might be a nice reminder. Oh, by the way, I have to do this too. Oh, read, <laughs> understood, and will adhere to the F of set four. Yeah, because if they see that and they check it, they, and they might think, oh shoot, I better go read that. Yep. Make sure that I'm okay. that that might trigger That's just that like an entry in their memory, and, and a lot of people don't even read the practice app. Um, I've talked to so many people that they've never even looked at it. So that's just a, a, a friendly what would be, reminder. What would be good, though, is if it's the electronic application in that body where it says they've read it, 
they could click on it and would pull it up so they could yes. read it right then just to be sure oh, that they got it accessible idea. to them. Very good idea. It's like terms and conditions. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. And Heather, one other question. For, um, do we, does the board have any information from those boards that do require an um, ethics course, for instance, physical therapists? Do we know any outcomes? Does that, you know, has their licensing board seen a decrease in consumer complaints of unethical practice? Or I kind of suspect, or is it just a revenue generating entity? <laughs> Um, I do not have any information about outcomes or even what years this, they started this. I mean, some of these, you know, could be 15, 18 years, in, you know, versus if somebody had done it recently. I mean, I feel like in the last five years, that'd be good to know, you know, did your number of complaints go down? Did fewer people lie on the renewal, for example? Um, but we did not look for that. We just looked to see what, what states have it. So, uh, so again, what's before this board in agenda item is 10 is the consideration of possible action on adding requirement of ethics course to professional development units completed as a condition of renewal. What I have heard being said is that we don't, it doesn't have to be a core. I've heard more of the comments I've heard are in favor of an attestation. Is that correct? Do we feel like we have enough for someone to make a motion? Or do we want to have further discussion? I'll make a motion um, that in, for item 10 that the board not take action on the proposal of the fund, of course, and rather for the logistical needs to force or to create the attestation requirement on the website or the application. Yeah, the renewal. Oh. So, do we have a second? Yeah. yeah. So, if we could just. Um, Take roll on that, please. Mm -hmm. Teresa? Yes. Bianca? Yes. Laura? Yes. Richard? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Denise? Yes. Sharon? Yes. So we're not taking action, and it's my understanding that we are putting the, the second part of that motion on a future agenda item, which will go to tomorrow. OK. OK. Tomorrow. Do we need to have a motion to instruct you to write the, the station statement? Um, is the attestation going on a yeah? Do we need to go into Is the attestation going on a future agenda item, or have we decided that we there I wasn't a clear? I thought, but it just said, but add the attestation yeah. to the license renewal. Okay, I didn't hear, but okay, I thought I heard consider adding. No, you said but add. Okay, okay. So we sorry, my bad. Okay, um, ready to go to item number eleven. Yep. Discussion and possible action regarding the effect on the license expiration date and required number of professional development units when a licensee changes their license status from inactive to active. <coughs> okay, so you have a letter from a licensee requesting that the board consider um, changing the expiration date of their license when they change uh, their license status from inactive to active. And using the exam this letter uh, in front of us, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give the example of what the woman is talking about. So for a March <coughs> odd year renewal, when you renew in March, your license is good until March of 2019. In this case, though, this woman will say had a March even year license renewal. So when she renewed in March of 16, she went inactive. One year later, in March of 17, she changed her license from inactive to active status. She had to do 24 PDUs in order to change to active status so she could practice. So the issue is that she just did 24 to renew or to change the license from inactive to active in March of 17. And when she renews again in March of 18, only one year later, she has to again do 24 PDUs. That's what this letter is about. 
And so what I provided for your information is the information, the laws relating to inactive status, as well as for license renewal and the continuing competency. And where it is a little bit um, long and wordy, um, for example, 4120 for the renewal, 4127 regarding inactive status, and 41 have like bolded the relevant um, parts to that. <laughs> Any comments from the board? Go for it. Well, I mean, it's not our, it, it's business professions code. <coughs> the, the, the whole thing about renewing the, the, the renewal term being every two years and the, the birth date, uh, birth month is, is outside of the OT Practice Act and regulations. It's another, it's subject to regulations affecting other boards. So I, I don't see how we have a choice. And that makes sense we would be to educate this uh, respondent about that. This is beyond the scope of our. So if she would have kept her license active all along, whether she was working or not, we wouldn't have this problem. That's correct. She would have. That's correct. I would keep up my license no matter what. <laughs> Well, and I would do the CEUs accordingly. Or in the alternative, using the example that when she went inactive in March of 16, not go active in March of 17, she could have just waited until her March of 18 renewal and done the 24 continuous one time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that could have been it. But I mean, her the point of her letter, though, is that she basically, uh, so now I have an inactive license. If I renewed now, uh, it would only be good for one year. The whole point about she's yeah. like mid-cycle, if you will, on a two-year renewal. Um, can I jump in really quickly? Um, uh, the general provisions of the Business and Professions Code, specifically 704B, if this is restoration to an active status, so because your practice act doesn't have a specific um, statute saying how you restore to an active status, you look at the general provisions, and 704B says, if the board requires completion of continuing education for renewers of an active license, uh, they must complete continuing education uh, equivalent to that required for a single license renewal period. We have that in reg. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So my point is, the reg is good. <laughs> I mean, we knew that the reg is good, but even if you wanted to change the reg, you really couldn't change it that much because you wouldn't be able to undo <coughs> that requirement law, because it's right. based on the statute. Right. So, so sorry, I just, that's all. Yeah. Well, it's like a fisherman who buys their license the last month of the year that. They got to buy a new one the first month the next year if they didn't use it yes. for the fact that you know it's the rule it's only good for the window of time that it's good for and mm -hmm. she has to do what it takes to follow me around to talk to her assembly person or center yeah. to make that yes. to work on getting that change well, I think, well, I think, it's, I think yeah. Laura's point yeah. is, yeah. is 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 look whether you're gonna think you're gonna be practicing or not you better off to just do what's necessary to be in a position if you decide to choose to, to practice, you can. And if not, it, it doesn't hurt you because you know you have you have these skills and this continuing education to make you a better person. So, so has a letter has there been a response to this person at all? No. Has there been any phone call? Nothing whatsoever. So she's no, she, no, no. She knows that it was on the agenda. This is the second time. The first time it came as public comment, and the question was, "Do you want this on a future agenda?" And you guys said yes, and so here it is. So now it's on a future agenda. We know that the response is related to what's in the reg language, and we know um, that our response is clear. Correct? We know what our response is, and we're in agreement. So do we have to take a motion nope. on any response to this, or is it clear the direction to, direction that we're that yes? Clear to me before discussing the second time. I'm sure that it was clear to you. I'm sure that it was clear. But, but how would we she have addressed her. it? But how would we have addressed it? Before you couldn't have that. You couldn't have. So okay. So okay. We appreciate. Yeah, it's just we kind of tying up the. the okay. Loop. Yeah. Okay. But we don't have any push to instruct you to. Right. Because you got it. Okay. Yeah. It's clear. Yeah. Do we have any public comment on the matter? 
All right, moving on to agenda item 12. Consideration of possible action of requiring completion of professional development units for first time license renewals. In the meeting materials, we have a letter requesting the board consider eliminating PDU exemption for first time license renewals, said author here in the audience. Um, and then the relevant section is also included, which is 4161. Again, the bolded part saying you have to do 24 PDUs and then buried on the second page in the bolded subsection E, it says shall not apply to the first license renewal qualifications of the license. Would you like to address the board? Ada, summarize your letter for yeah. or Certainly. specifically what you want us to um, I would uh, thank you very much. Um, Ada Boone Hurl, practitioner, I believe is the, the way that I'm presenting at the moment. Um, it, although I do indicate that I'm an educator in there as well, so I guess I'll say that. And I need to because accreditation standards render an entry level practitioner. They've had X number of hours of clinical field work experience. Where, with by being able to forego continuing education during the first renewal cycle, these are the practitioners with the least amount of experience who potentially, based on this first year and renewal cycle, can go the longest without continuing education. And entry level practice is a is a transient entry level is a transient period that after a year or so. You're practicing. You're, to, in my view, you're practicing. And when you're given 175 accreditation standards, and a vast majority of those are directed at content, um, I mean, yes, everything is addressed, but it doesn't make you necessarily proficient. It makes you proficient enough to pass the national exam and to enter a profession. Uh, I, I have on more than one occasion heard new graduate practitioners as they prepare, uh, well they're not even new graduates anymore because if they're exempt on the first cycle and now they've got the two year period, they've been out there practicing. And um, because they, they didn't have to do it the first time and they, it's like, oh my gosh, now I have to do it. It's their first time I've heard, you know, oh, I've got to read a bunch of articles. I, oh, I've got to find a class online. I've got to, do all these things that they're cramming for a test. Okay. And that really upsets me, that worries me that that they go that period of time <clears throat> without um, continuing education and the professional responsibility to do so, uh, the safety in their judgment, the finesse of their skills. And um, I did provide, I went to, using the Bureau of Labor Statistics, I went to the five top states employing OTs and OTAs to find out what the language um, was in, uh, in these other states. And while some of them, yes, they do exempt within the first renewal cycle, um, there is um, Texas, for example, required during the first renewal cycle. Um, Texas being a, a comparable state in terms of size of employment of OT practitioners to California, um, and um, Florida, another state that's also comparable in terms of the uh, percentage of practitioners uh, to California, exemptive license in the second half of a biennium, so if you're getting ready to um, renew, um, they're, they're able to forego the continuing education. Uh, I. Would great, I, I greatly appreciate the board even taking this and considering it. I do believe it's in the interest of consumer safety that all <clears throat> practitioners begin their career and end their career with ongoing continuing education, regardless of when they graduated. Thank you. Any comments? Thoughts? I, if yes. I can share, um, I think um, I think one of the things to be aware of is with this um, exemption for the first renewal, 
also predates biennial license renewal. So at the board's inception, everyone renewed annually, right? And so I think, uh, I wasn't here when this rigged, but I'm guessing that, especially for new grads, not necessarily um, people practicing in another state coming, but they don't want somebody graduating and getting a license and having to do C, like right then, you know? So, but with this, this new way of the biannual license renewal, that ties in your birth month, your minimum period of time for an initial license is seven months or your maximum is 30 months. And to Ada's point about not renewing, that if I'm somebody who um, gets a license in March of 17 and it's good until um, October 17, for, or, sorry, 19, for example, um, and then I'm waived, then I'm not doing it until October 2021, and you can see that's almost four years. <clears throat> so, uh, to her point, I just want to give you the background about when this exemption was in here, I, what I believe is the, was the rationale for having the waiver for the first time. Again, because we were doing it every year. Yes. It was really most of, what, 14 months, 18 months before? Because it is, your license expires in your first month, right? Right, so a minimum license could be seven months. Right. So this is March, um, and I have an October odd year birthday. I would expire on October 31st of this year, so seven months. Or and my next renewal would be then, when, would, not uh, not under what currently, but if we were to change it, um, it would be it would be. A well, year. the renew the renewal period wouldn't change. No. Instead, just even somebody licensed as short as seven months would have to do the PDUs right. for renewal. And then likewise, the one who currently gives an almost four-year exemption would not, you know, you eliminate the, the weight. Well, Heather, so I was licensed in, just in a January and my birthday's in April. So if uh, if we were to remove this, would I, and I was again licensed in January as a new grad, or a new therapist, and then April comes up, would I have to do 24 hours by April? Okay, so... Or um, hours. So let's use this year as an odd year. Yeah. So if, um, no, because instead of instead of expiring in April of this year, it would be April of 2019. So you'd get like a 26, 27 month license okay. on your initial period to get you into that birth month, birth year cycle. <clears throat> So are you looking, or I'm trying to figure out, are we looking for some type of guidance on whether we want to pursue um, in that cycle? You don't have to do it in the first period of time, but by the end of it you have to? Or would you want to say that you reduce the number of PDUs that would be done in the very first portion of that like that first licensing period? How, how would we be looking? Well, we probably want to remove the Okay. Uh, this, is the, yeah, this is basically a proposal to remove 4161. What is it? 339. Remove or modify? Any. Okay. The public's comments makes it, um, just in the interest of moving the discussion, whereas the public's comments make very good sense to me. The comments provided by our executive director show us the history of it. It makes it makes a lot of good sense from consumer safety for us to act on this. That that's my uh, position. Does anybody want to jump in? No, I think I'm in a fairly good position. I'm just waiting. Is there something we're missing from the opposite side? I'm not. It's not clear to me if the benefit and retaining. I mean, within this language, so as so we hear any opposition to that, I really don't have any ideas of why. Do you know what the opposition would so, be? Uh, so if I was to play devil's advocate about not eliminating this, then I would say, well, the person who is licensed this month and has to do 24 PDUs by October and November has a very short amount of time to do the same amount of hours that somebody who's licensed for two years gets. That would be issue. I don't know. That's that's. There's a related the language in the, in our packet actually on in the state in the AOTA for item six in the AOTA uh, state uh, you know, regulation stuff continuing competency requirements. The New Hampshire one has a very convoluted and interesting uh, bunch of language here about. Um, 
If more than 52 but fewer than 34 weeks have elapsed since applications pass the NBCO2 exam, they shall maintain continuing competency by completing 12 hours. So they have a formula uh, uh, section there, which is, uh, I'm not saying you want to go there, but, uh, right. but it's an interesting uh, Concept. model. Because it is, a, it is a very real thing that on the flip side that people are going to come to you. So I, then I wonder if the discussion is we agree that we have to go, we agree that we, from a consumer sta safety standpoint, we have to do something around this renewal and then we figure out the action around that, if, if that's really where we're trying to go. Do you have any recommendation, anything that you would suggest that from? Well, I mean, easiest is simply striking the E, <laughs> as Richard pointed out. Um, uh, with um, consideration of the individual who only has a seven or eight month initial license that has to complete 24 PDUs and, and everyone else on an ongoing renewal has 24 months to do that, um, I think that you know, in terms of fairness and, uh, and concept, you could do a, a prorated portion. PDU per month of license or something like that. You know, if your initial license is issued for a period of less than one year, your PDUs are then waived. If your initial license is issued for one year or longer, you have to do like everybody else. Okay. Yes. It, the one year or less, I think, is covered by the term entry level. And, and that, so if it were one year or less, personally, I would be at peace in being a new graduate with one year or less. But if it were more than a year, to me now you're practicing. That you know, when you look at the definition of entry level, you're a beginner. And after a year, you're not a beginner anymore. You're making decisions about you know how you operate in the clinic. So it, less than a year, I think, captures that entry level piece. Greater than a year, you're a practitioner of, of a new <coughs> practitioner, but yet still a practitioner. So that, I mean, that could be solved just the modification of language on item E, where it says the section does not apply to the first license renewal if you strike out the following and put within one year of issuance of the initial license. A <coughs> Okay. I mean, that makes sense in the language. Right? That would be a simple modification of language rather than striking out the entire. Yeah, and then you might need to add a little bit saying, and then. I like where you're going with that. Mm -hmm. too. I'm just trying to think of like, is it clear enough? Right, we're Because yeah. it's not like we're basically changing it. It sounds clear to me. Okay. Well, I mean, just. Would you be willing to do that one more time? I was, so, section 8 reads this section shall not apply to the first license renewal following issuance of the initial license. So, my proposal is to strike out the word following and simply replace it with within one year. So it would read, the section shall not apply to the first license renewal within one year of issuance of the initial license. So if you're pursuing occurring renewal within, within, occurring, occurring, within, within, occurring within one year of issuance of initial license. I would probably tweak it, but I mean, it sounds like that would cover it. So my guess from here, or what I, my initial thought is, so between that one year and that two year before you renew again, what do you? What are your requirements? Do you have to do the full 24, or do you only do 12 because it's half of you know half of what you would do in a biennial period? Yeah. So that's what I think is like the next step that needs to be included in the regs. Otherwise, you guys are going to get a ton of questions or a bunch of people doing it wrong. <laughs> do you? Do you? Do either of you? And again, I'm. I'm not intending to put anyone on the spot, but do either of you in reading, let's just say, for purposes of continuing this discussion, this section shall not apply the first license occurring within one year of issuance of a life. Again, we know where I'm going. <coughs> Taking into account what um, Ileana just added, can we look at the rest of the items and give some suggestions for language, or or do you want to hold over? What, what do you want? You know, your language. Do you want to bring it back to the board? Do you want? Well, the, the other question I have, since I mean, since the New Hampshire brought up the point of what happens if a person passes the exam but then doesn't practice? Do we have language currently that deals with people who have 
have been are permitted to practice but have, chose, have chosen not to and have not taken classes or, or worked, right? So they don't have the, they've never sought licensure and, and then two years later they seek licensure but they pass the test. Do we limit them from being able to do that, or would they have had um, to do Actually, if you look towards the bottom of the same page, in section G, mm -hmm. so for somebody who hasn't been in practice for uh, within right. the past five years, they have to do 40 hours. Right. So that's outlined. Yeah. So that that's to get this non-practicing person kind of like up to speed quickly so that they can re-enter the workforce. But that for a full five-year period? Yeah, that's why I don't know whether it means they, it's more than five years, or is it any any... For so that's only for right. applicants, right. applicants for a license. Right. So um, I graduated from school in 2000 and took and passed my exam, got certified by ABCOT, and then I was a stay-at-home mom. Right. And now my kids are older and I want to get my license. Right. So then I would have to do this. I would have to do this 40 PDUs in order to kind of bring me up to speed before I re-enter the workforce due to my absence of more than five years. More than five years, but it doesn't well, go back okay, early. Yeah. yeah, but I'm just saying is that, well, at least on the New Hampshire one, it's very clear, so it's like 52 wow. weeks, and you know, you we'll start having the... But that's for license renewal for somebody okay. who's already been okay. renewing okay. Okay. and doing, you know, right? What is it? New Hampshire? Yes. No, 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 New Hampshire says, um, the section, a continuing competence shall be maintained by applicants who pass the MBQs. NBCOT exam more than 52 weeks before submitting the application and have not practiced as an occupational therapy since passing the examination. So that's the kid who takes a gap year after their OT uh, completion and didn't work. They have to do 24. They have to do continuing education. And then B is somebody who's uh, for if between 52 weeks but fewer than 104 weeks. In other words, between one and two years. Uh, then they have to do 12 hour, 12 hours. And then if it's two years or more, then they have to do 24 hours. So that kind of addresses. But then the question becomes, so with that good input, the question becomes, do we really feel upon looking at our own language that we couldn't do strikeouts, additions to E, or do we feel like we have to go to that kind of language? I think you just. Um, I don't, so frankly. I don't think we have to go to all new language. Although I like, you know, um, but that doesn't, you know, I'm just one person. What does everyone else think? If you, if anyone's so moved to go to new language, other than other, she's going to tell us. <laughs> any public comment have any input? So I think if, if you're gonna if you're gonna take that initial license, you're going to separate out the one who has a very short period of time and not enough time, then you can waive it, saying shall not apply to the first license renewal occurring within one year of issuance of the initial license. Uh, um, a licensee applying for their first license renewal occurring greater than one year upon issuance of the initial license shall complete 12 hours, for example. And then, so then that, that catches your 12, 12 to 30 month folks, and then once they, they do this 12 hours, then they're all, like everyone else, they're on 24 hours every 24 months ongoing, globally. But that is sort of a way to... Yeah. So you're gonna, so then would you be coming back with suggested language for us at the next? Board meeting oh, or, um, or, <coughs> or we can move that out now. Okay, that's what I'm trying to figure yes. out. Okay, so you know, another you know quarter. Great. And then, um, did you notice how you how the language divides out the 37 and three at the bottom? I'm just curious if everyone noticed that. With the ethics three. Okay. Any other recommendations, Heather? About the language when you look at it. I mean, obviously, I think it can be wordsmith when I'm not under pressure to do something on the spot. But I, I but feel that's like not necessary. If you guys agree, then what we could do is I can work with Ileana with that, and we can start the ball rolling if that's the board's pleasure. So I move so to. Need a I, would, I would move to ask the executive officer and legal counsel to draft language that would allow for a 
person 12 months, between 12 and 24 months of uh, experience after renewal to uh, uh, renewal within fewer than 12 months of the initial license issuance. So less than 12 months from a list initial licensure, then you have to do none. Two motions. And then more than a year, then you do 12. Right. And then if you're in two years, you do right? Yeah. So between 12 and 24 months, you do 12. And then once you hit 24 on, then you're just like everybody else. Right. But for his motion, isn't his motion specifically to direct the executive director and the attorney to work together on the wordsmithing of the issuance of a license for purposes of, of action of requiring completion of for first time licensees? Isn't that the motion, really? That is the motion, but I kind of want to get a sense of how many hours for what kind of, for how much experience. Because I think that's. Without that information, we can't really draft a whole lot. Right. Can I sit with a suggestion then? Yes. Um, so the waiver, if it occurs within the one year, and a license renewal occurring more than one year after the issuance of the initial license shall complete 12 hours. Correct. Say that one more time. That's great. So a licensee renewing. I'm sorry, uh, applying for the first license renewal occurring more than one year after the initial license has been issued shall complete 12 hours. Well, the first one, the waiver is less than 12 months, mm -hmm. but then after Jeez. that's greater than, got it. Does that satisfy where you would yes, like to go? Yes, that is good. Okay. Like <laughs> what about, so do we have to restate that for the purposes of the record to get a second? I think, did anybody not get that? I think where Ileana was going to ask is about the person who qualifies by passing the test but doesn't apply for license for more than Do you want to restate 12 it? So He's going to restate his motion. I wrote this down. So okay. A licensee applying for his, her first license renewal within one year of when the license was issued shall complete 12 PDUs. No. <laughs> so there, there are PDUs are waived. Yeah, and then if it's months. more than one year, so 366 oh, more days, than. then they have to do 12 hours. More than, but we can't have a less than date. Right, and that's what I was going to ask next. Is do you want it to be from? Yeah, if we're going to put in that amount, I, I personally would like very specific. More than this, but less than that. Or more not to exceed however you want the language to be. But a very definitive less endpoint. Less than two years. Okay. No, no, no. It could be three. No. No. Three years. Do, I mean, do you want to do less or zero? Because then you're going to have to talk about 24 years to 30 months. No. I mean, no, 24 no. months to 30 months. I would say, I, I would recommend it's the cleanest to say if your renewal occurs less than one year after your license was issued, you shall not. Wait, you don't have to do anything. You have to do anything. You shall not. The section does not apply. And then your other one says if your first license renewal occurs. More than one year after the license was issued, you are responsible for completing 12 hours. Yes. Okay. And it's assumed then that that's the 24. Do you, that's the two year. Do you see where I'm going? 12 hours. 12 what? hours. 12. I think yes. she's just asking where are you getting 12 instead of 24? Oh, because it's one year. It's I, am the required that, amount. Okay. I am getting that it's one year, but there's 12 from that previous year, so okay. it's really not to exceed. 24. What we're trying to get is not to exceed 24 months. We're trying to move them into, we're trying to groom them into the two year renewal. So, do you want to put in a maximum, like between 12 months and 24 months, or don't do the maximum? I don't want the maximum. Okay, no. just making sure that I, I'm ready. That's fine. That's, that's a system of it. Okay. Because, because system. right now we only issue licenses for as few as seven months or as many as 30. And the 30 would be like, this is March of uh, 17. 19, so this is like my birthday is in August of an odd year, and you can't give me a license from March of 17 to August of 17, so instead you're, I'm going to get a license from March of 17 to August of 19, 19 so it's this very 
So it's much like a year longer. and a half, and that's when you would do 12 hours. Two and a half years, though. Yeah. I mean, for that time. Yeah. For yeah. example, I just did. Yeah. Right, but that would be 12 hours. That's yeah, correct. that would be 12 right because it's, good it's you're trying to get them on the cycle, on the two-year cycle, but in that you're getting so half of the required amount. So it's less than what a regular person would be doing, correct, but it's not as much as, okay, thank you. So they only need just got my clarification on one and a half hours. So in other words, there's no waiver unless you're licensed for less than one year. And your or your first renewal occurs less than one year from when the license is issued. The initial license was issued. Then you have zero. So I have a motion. <laughs> and it has to say initial. And it has to say initial because what happens if a person right. yes. just lapsed and then we, came back in? We don't want them to be able to take it. Right. Right. Can I can I ask one more question before you do a, your? Will you lose your motion if no, I ask a no. question? Okay. <laughs> so what you did there, Heather, just to be clear to understand that is you took this issue of this four years, you divided it into two by adding the hundred twelve, even though there's going to be up to 30 months that second time they renew. See where I'm going? No. It's well, a, you no. just did that with the March on What I'm saying is that, what I said is that the license would be issued in March and expire in August of 17. That's too sh too short of a time. Correct. Okay. So, so it's the less than 12 months part of the So, so right. the next part is that well, the, the, so the person who got a license this month with an August odd year birthday, it would go issued this month and it would be valid until August 31st, 2019. That person would have to complete 24 PDUs. Correct. Well, but how many months? Well. Is, how many months is August 19 from now? Um, that's 30 months. 30, yeah, right. Roughly. So, so that's I don't see the difference then, guys. I'm sorry to be. Well, so I don't see how. Use an example. If I'm in March and August of 2019, <coughs> right now, I would have to do zero. Right. And then in August of 19 to 20 to 21, then I do my 24. And you can but wait to the end. 24 yeah. in August of 2021, and I was licensed. Then it March goes. Okay. Then, from my own understanding, it goes back to the initial statement I made. The first one, if it's under a year, that's what we've added here, the less than 12. There still could be a time where there's up to 30 months. That second so the license app. period isn't changing. Right. It's okay. only the PDUs. Right. And they Got do it. get a small bit of a break because they're going to be issued a longer initial license period prior to their okay. first renewal. But they would have to do 12 instead of zero. Yeah. That's the difference. Is that uh, address your concern? Do you feel like 12 is a good number? I, I think something. Yeah. So they're not going to full 30 oh, right. months. Just put some in the groove, right? Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Exactly. Because yeah. this will need to be justified in the in the ruling. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the program. Richard, did like you? That. I'm rewriting it <laughs> so that I can read it. And so maybe I can give it someone else because I can't read my writing. Anyway. <laughs> So, okay. Go ahead. okay, I move two part motion. Part one amend 4161E to read this section shall not apply to the first license renewal occurring within one year of the initial license. Second part to the motion add. Another section. Section, whatever. Said, stating a licensee applying for the first license renewal more than one year after the initial license was issued shall complete 12 years. Do we have a second? Does that reflect that it's, sorry, does that reflect that it was, that it's still there? They've never renewed their license. Kind of. I a licensee to... applying for the first license renewal oh, yes. okay. more than one year after the initial license was issued. Okay. So I think so. Okay, yes. Uh, and also, of course, I also will authorize the executive officer and legal counsel to make sure make it's not substantial change. I'll second that. If we could take a roll. Two seconds. Yes. Yes. Laura. Yes. Richard? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Please? Yes. Sharon? Yes. So to be clear, you're satisfied with that language, which is yes. really what matters, and you could implement 
that in the office. Okay. And that's a good example. Of not, it goes without saying, that's a very good example that you could, in our own outreach efforts, of coming before the board and really seeing something go into an action and action being taken. And we're very thankful for you to bring that to the board's attention. So 2025, that would be. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> But it'll happen. Now, with that being said, um, if they're seeing that there are there any further comments, because we are going into closed session. Any further comments? Our meeting tomorrow is in a different location, so please make sure you take everything that you have here. We leave this pristine. A big thank you again to our host from San Jose State University. Um, and with a big thank you to our webcasters. And with that being stated, we are going to adjourn at 3.45 p.m. to close session. Um, and see you, the rest of you, tomorrow. When we reopen an open session, there's we're just reopening and closing again. So you're welcome to stay if that little administrative piece interests you, but we are <laughs> All right.